one please start sir we are live hello uh, good evening everyone uh, pleasure welcome you all uh, for this very exciting session uh, which is done uh, under the aegis of cancer research and statistics foundation and it's a great initiative by the on covid cancer center the topic for today is quite interesting and relevant roof immunotherapy in the management of lung cancer uh, it's, it's a pleasure to welcome the organizing team dr rushab kotari dr gorang bodhi and dr kesh kotani uh, to set the ball rolling in the context it's a pleasure to welcome dr rushab kotari uh, the co-founder of on covid cancer center at amdabad good evening and over to you dr rushab sir for your welcome note and taking the proceedings for the please over to you sir uh thank you mr taru uh, so uh, i'm very exciting to uh, discuss regarding role of immunotherapy uh, in lung cancer and we will be discussing uh, some portion of uh, non immunotherapy options in management of lung cancer especially in the second line uh, i would like to thank all the scientific partners uh, medgenome roche astrazeneca celon msd uh, for this uh, support uh, we have tried to cover most of the aspects of immunotherapy right from new adjuvant adjuvant a metastatic first line second line and some options where uh, immunotherapy is not feasible we have tried to cover even vegf inhibitors and then we will have a panel discussion at the end and we start off with which markers are important for immunotherapy so we have tried to keep it as comprehensive as possible from immunotherapy point of view uh we had a similar conference last year for driver mutation positive so this is largely for driver mutation negative patients so uh i would hand over to dr gaurang for introducing speakers uh, for the first session in the second session uh, dr itesh will do the same uh, so dr gaurang uh, if you can introduce the speaker and uh, then we can start off with the first Sir, I we uh, we can't see Doctor Gorang has yet joined. He's trying. So is okay. it possible? So can I we so we can. We can so uh, I welcome Doctor Suruchi Agarwal, and uh, with him we have Doctor Sayyad. Both of them will throw light on biomarkers for usage of immunotherapy drugs. Uh, we will largely concentrate on different type of PDL ones and TMB and MSI and other markers. Uh, which are important to decide on immunotherapy treatment. Uh, over you, over to you, Doctor Suruchi. Thank you, thank you so much, Doctor Rushu. Uh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for giving an opportunity. I'll uh, share my screen. Is my screen visible? Yeah, we are able to see. Okay, and are my slides visible? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so a very good evening to everyone. Uh, I am Suruchi Agarwal and I work as a, a senior scientist on oncology at Medgenome Labs. So we are basically a diagnostic lab uh, for molecular testing in this part of the world, catering to mostly Southeast Asia. And in today's session, uh, I have uh, basically, uh, I would talk about immunotherapy biomarkers in non-small cell lung cancer. And uh, uh, I'll, uh, Dr. Syed uh, is my colleague, and he will be uh, talking in detail about PDL1. However, I will set the stage with uh, introduction to immunotherapy biomarkers and discuss about TMB and MSI in detail. So, just you know, starting off with uh, like Globocan 2020 data, we have a high burden of lung cancer, which is almost 5.5 percent of all cancers and out of which non-small cell lung cancer accounts for approximately 85 percent of all lung cancer cases and if we see in recent years we have shifted the treatment paradigm from chemotherapy that is cytotoxic therapies to personalized uh, targeted therapies <clears throat> that will act upon specific genomic alterations and uh, uh, prognosis of non-small cell lung cancer as we know is extremely poor with very low five-year uh, overall survival rate However, uh, with immunotherapy, it has been seen that five-year survival rate of patients with non-small cell lung cancer has increased uh, significantly. <clears throat> uh, immunotherapy, no doubt, has revolutionized uh, cancer therapy in recent years, and immune checkpoint inhibitors, they have demonstrated 
unprecedented rates of durable responses in some of the most difficult to treat cancers. However, there are a group of patients where there is no response or there are serious side effects. So in order to select a group of patients that will be benefited from immunotherapy, we have to identify certain uh, biomarkers uh, with high sensitivity and specificity. So this is like we have to tailor immunotherapy treatment regimens uh, and several biomarkers, uh, they are being explored uh, for this reason. That could be like some serum proteins, tumor-specific receptor expression patterns. There could be factors in tumor microenvironment. There could be circulating immune or tumor cells. There could be some host genomic factors or like, um, like uh, I mean, uh, common uh, biomarkers that we uh, look at in uh, uh, for immunotherapy like PDL1, TMB, and MSI. So biomarkers, basically, they remain a missing link as there are uh, limited large uh, prospective trials uh, to establish validation on their use and assay development and interpretation. So we, we have to look uh, more into that part to establish uh, biomarkers to actually identify a group of patients that will be inhibited through uh, immunotherapies. So we have a candidate biomarkers, uh, which can be, uh, you know, uh, tested for immunotherapy response prediction. So this, this particular slide shows holistic approach that can be used, you know, to predict immunotherapy response. For example, there is a lung cancer patient, we will identify tumor mutations that can be identified in tumor tissue or circulating tumor DNA. Uh, with NGS sequencing, we can also identify tumor mutation burden, PDL one we can identify through IHC and there are other biomarkers like immune microenvironment, T-cell inflamed, uh, gene expression profiling for some cytokine related genes and cancer driver mutations or co-mutations that are occurring along with the, these immune uh, checkpoint biomarkers. So holistically we can determine immunotherapy response. Common immunotherapy uh, biomarkers in non-small cell lung cancer is like PDL1, which is most extensively studied uh, and uh, targeted FDA approved targeted therapies are available. It is defined as a percentage of tumor cell expressing the PDL1 protein. Uh, and it is determined based on different scorings, which will be discussed by Dr. Sayad in detail. Uh, TMV is a tumor mutational burden, a number of mutations per MV of DNA or uh, genome, and it is predictive biomarker for clinical benefit from immune uh, checkpoint inhibitors. And TMV greater than 10 mutation uh, word, uh, per MV of genome is considered as intermediate or high, more than 15 is usually considered as high. And this is mismatch repair deficiency, uh, defect in mismatch repair genes or uh, we call it as microsatellite instability. And this is a actually solid tumor agnostic marker across different uh, solid metastatic cancers. And this timeline figure provides uh, like what, uh, what uh, drugs or targeted therapies were approved in uh, like in which year. So as you can see for non-small cell lung cancer, PDL1, IHC, 22C3, uh, for this particular clone, Pembrolizumab was approved in 2015 uh, for PDL1 SP142 for Edizolizumab uh, approved uh, for non-small cell lung cancer in 2018 for Ipilimumab uh, IHC 288 uh, non-small cell lung cancer in 2020 and TMB and MSI we have collectively for all solid tumors uh, approved. Coming on to TMB. So tumor mutation burden, as I said, is a total number of somatic mutations uh, that occur per MV of genome. And it correlates with high neoantigen presentation uh, or levels that will activate anti-tumor immune response. So as you can see, it is low, so new antigens are not there, but high neoantigens are there. So they are uh, in non-small cell lung cancer, TMB levels are typically high in smokers or in former smokers, and low TMB score is mainly found in never smokers. TMB levels, they also vary with driver mutation profiles. For example, if it is a KRAS, MET, or BRAF mutated a non-small cell lung cancer, it will usually have TMB high profiles as compared to EGFR, ALK, or OSMAN-driven cancer. Even in EGFR-driven cancer, if it is exon 19 del mutated, they may have low TMB as compared to LA 
858R or 719 uh, mutated tumors. However, TMB is a dynamic biomarker and it is always influenced by uh, the previous therapies, chemotherapy or radiotherapy, which actually impacts tumor microenvironment. So it basically depends on the microenvironment of the tumor uh, based on the state of the patient or uh, therapy, former therapies that has been given to the patient. So TMB has to be carefully uh, uh, correlated with the uh, therapy indications. How to test TMB? So as we, uh, as we discussed that TMB is acquired somatic mutations, number of somatic mutations that occur in per MB of genome. So total coding region that is uh, like uh, covered in our assay is 1.5 greater than 1.5 MB. There are uh, different methods to determine tumor mutation burden. It could be whole exome sequencing, uh, but we have FDA approved tests like foundation one MSK impact. So as you can see, foundation one covers 1.1 MB of the panel that Foundation One uses, it covers 1.1 MB uh, length of uh, genome, and MSK Impact uses approximately 1.5 MB. And uh, these are the different types of mutations across uh, the genome that is being captured by each assay. So WES captures non-synonymous coding mutations as well as oncogenic drivers. And synonymous and non-synonymous mutations are captured by uh, Foundation One and non-synonymous and oncogenic drivers again by MSK impact. So this slide is just to show you that what is available as a benchmark and what we are using at MedGenome. So we are covering like 485 genes that spans around 1.65 MV of a genome. And uh, next generation sequencing is performed at greater than 250x depth. Uh, TMB and clinically relevant actionable variants are reported in a single assay and uh, uh, inter uh, results are interpreted as per international guidelines. Sample type oh, is... Sorry. Yes. Sorry. Okay. So sample type is FFP tissue block with greater than 10% tumor content. Uh, if we talk about a microsatellite uh, instability or defects in MMR, MMR uh, genes, they are short, randomly repeated sequences of one to six nucleotide uh, long, and they, they can be uh, located anywhere in the genome, like in gene or intergenic regions, uh, regions mostly present in introns or promoter regions. Uh, so there could be like uh, repetition of those sequences or uh, in, uh, gain of uh, those repeat sequences. So for example, and it will lead to replication errors. So this particular slide shows PCR fragment analysis. So this is a normal uh, tissue or uh, a normal from a normal blood uh, profile. So there's a single peak, but if here you see, there are two, two different uh, types of um, uh, lengths of microsatellite we will get. So we are getting two different peaks. So uh, instability has happened here. So in the tumor. So that's how PCR fragment analysis is uh, done uh, to determine MSI. So cancers that harbor uh, uh, mismatch repair defects, they are hypermutated and they accumulate mutations in microsatellites and they are prone to mismatch errors. So it can be tested using immunohistory chemistry for DMMR for expression of uh, particular genes like uh, MS, MSH6, PMS2, MLH1, MLH2. It can be also done by polymerase chain reaction, that is PCR-based method, and it can also be done by next-generation sequencing approaches these days. MSI is usually a hallmark of Lynch syndrome, uh, and uh, it is a predictive biomarker for immunotherapy in various solid tumors. So we, we have all the three types of tests, that is IHC, PCR fragment analysis, and 27 markers by NGS. And similarly, uh, sample requirement is FFP tissue block. Uh, so uh, like we discussed that uh, holistic uh, testing is important to determine the predictive immunotherapy response or targeted therapy response. So this is a comprehensive solution that we have. It covers complete coding regions of 500 plus genes and uh, uh, like all base substitutions, fusions, amplifications are covered. Uh, and uh, TMB and MSI status can also be determined in this assay. And PDL1 expression by IHC is optional to be added to this assay. And sample type is similar. So this slide I've taken from ESMO guidelines, and it shows uh, basically the 
relationship among different types of uh, immunotherapy biomarkers. So I just thought uh, to show this slide because in non-small cell lung cancer, you can see that MSI is just 1.1% overlapping in the samples. However, MSI, uh, sorry, uh, PDL1 and TMB biomarkers, immunotherapy biomarkers, they are overlapping in almost 12% of patients. So the the uh, the testing of biomarkers completely, like all the biomarkers, is important to determine the uh, response to immunotherapy rather than just going ahead with one biomarker. This slide also again shows that in non-small cell lung cancer, MSI prevalence is very low. And this is the this is the slide which shows that in uh, non-small cell lung cancer, there are various drivers. Uh, driver mutations and immunotherapy response could be different in, in the lung cancer, which have different drivers. For example, in L career uh, cancers, response to IO can be up 0 to 20 percentage. BRAF mutation, it could be high because they, they are TMB high as, as we discussed, 25 to 33 percentage. Again, in KRAS, it is 57 percentage. Again, KRAS mutated tumors are TMB high. So, so uh, this is this is a nice uh, review which showed like the response rate to IO could be uh, different in uh, differently mutated cancers. And this last slide I had put uh, to show like uh, what are the biomarker strategies uh, because if you see uh, this is a PDL one as well as TMB high group. So here the quality of new antigens uh, is good. And uh, uh, the targeted of uh, uh, target other immune checkpoint inhibitors, and it 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 overcomes T cell exhaustion. So uh, we need to check again to reiterate the point that both the biomarkers or all uh, immunotherapy biomarkers needs to be tested uh, for better uh, immunotherapy uh, response prediction. So over to Dr. Syed to discuss PDL one uh, testing in detail. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sayed, can you please uh, share your slides? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Dr. Suraj. Thank you. Any questions? I'm open to questions. Uh, uh, we can have questions once uh, Dr. Sayed uh, completes okay. so that. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I'm sharing my screen. Is my screen visible? Yes, Dr. Sayer. Yeah, good you evening, on and on. Uh -huh. In continuation, let me Yeah, yeah. You are audible and we are able to see this. Yeah. Thank you uh, for the organizers for inviting me for uh, presenting uh, on PDL1 IHC testing. So, in continuation with the previous talk, I will be discussing mainly uh, PDL1 IHC testing landscape in non small cell lung cancer. So, coming to PDL1, it's an immune checkpoint protein which is expressed on the activated immune cells and tumor cells. It mainly binds to PD1, which is a key regulatory surface receptor on CD8 positive T cells. And tumor scan evade anti-tumor immune activity by exploiting unregulated PDL1 expression in the tumor microenvironment. So expression of PDL1 in cancer is an adaptive immune resistance mechanism mainly to avoid T-cell mediated anti-tumor immune response. So this slide mainly depicts the PD1 PDL1 pathway. On the left side, uh, so the PDL1 bearing tumor cell when it binds to the PD1 on the T-cell so this brings about an inhibitory signal leading to inhibition of immune response resulting in tumor growth. Whereas uh, on the right side, so the uh, same when this uh, uh, connection between PD-1 and PDL one is broken using uh, anti-PD-1 and anti-PDL1 immune checkpoint inhibitors. So this uh, uh, leads to activation of the T-cell immune-mediated response and uh, and hence the, the anti-tumor immune response gets activated. And this is the role of immune checkpoint inhibitors. In this now, coming to the different uh, PDL1 clones, where, um, what we have at MedGenome, 
uh, basically I have classified it into a companion diagnostic assays and the complementary diagnostic assay. So a companion diagnostic assay uh, as defined by the FDA is an in vitro device, provides information that is essential for safe and effective use of a corresponding drug. Whereas a complementary diagnostic assay mainly aids in benefit risk decision-making about uh, use of a therapeutic drug where a difference between uh, benefit and risk is clinically meaningful. So uh, we have 20, uh, DACO 22C3 and SP142, which fall into the companion diagnostic assays, whereas the Ventana PDL1 SP263, which mainly is a complementary diagnostic assay. So, as I said earlier, a companion diagnostic assay is a qualitative, a complete package immunohistochemical assay mainly designed to detect the PDL1 on the tumor infiltrating immune cells as well as on the tumor cells. So the first upper portion of the image shows uh, uh, a PDL1 SP142 assay where the, we need to have a Ventana uh, platform with a Ventana SP142 antibody along with the secondary kits like uh, Optiview detection and amplification kit and the negative reagent control. Uh, along with the interpretation guide or the where uh, uh, recommendations for uh, scoring particular PDL1 in uh, uh, especially for that particular clone. So this is a complete package. Uh, so hence FDA has approved. So similarly on the same lines, uh, uh, DACO, which is a auto strainer, uh, Link 48. Um, uh, it's a semi-automated platform where along with uh, you, uh, usage, using a PDL1 22C3 form DX kit and along with other secondary kit components, along with the interpretation manual, which gives definite guidelines and uh, the method uh, and uh, uh, evaluating the exact PDL1 scoring in varied tumors. So, this, as I said earlier, we have uh, three different clones, SP263 from Ventana, uh, 22C3 from DACO, and SP142 again from Ventana. Uh, in the SP263 clone, we, uh, scoring algorithm will be, or uh, tumor proportion score we will be giving, and the approved immuno-oncology drugs are the dorolumab and the nivolumab. In 22C3, which is an FDA approved uh, uh, I say so where uh, we specifically, uh, especially in non-small cell lung cancer, we give a tumor proportion score where embrolizumab is uh, uh, indicated. Uh, and I'll be coming to the cutoffs in the subsequent slides. And uh, PDL1 SP142, which is from Ventana, here the scoring system is mainly we give a tumor cell percentage and the immune cell percentage. And atezolizumab has been approved for positive SP142 cases. So the slide mainly shows uh, varied uh, scoring algorithms available. Uh, so as I said earlier, SP263 and for 22C3, so we specifically give a tumor proportion score, which is nothing but uh, total number of uh, PDL1 positive tumor cells, which divided by total number of uh, the viable tumor cells, irrespective of whether it is positive or negative. So it's nothing but the total proportion out of 100, how many cells are positively stained with PDL1. So varied cutoffs for this are less than 1%. We call it as no PDL1 expression. 1 to 49% uh, low PDL1 expression with uh, TPS more than or equal to 50, high PDL1 expression. So coming to the SP142 clone here, uh, we uh, detect or uh, uh, calculate the TC and the IC separately. So in two step, with, uh, two steps. Initially, first we check for uh, tumor cell staining. So if it is more than fifty percent, it is called positive. So if um, yeah, presence of discernible PDL1 immune membrane staining of any intensity, if it is more than fifty percent, we call it as positive. If TC is not uh, less than 50 or no staining in the tumor cells, then we should move to assess and check the tumor infiltrating immune cell, what we call as IC staining. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. So IC staining, so again, it's a presence of discernible PDL1 staining of any intensity in tumor infiltrating immune cells, it can be macrophages, neutrophils, plasma cells, or lymphocytes. 
covering more than 10% of the tumor area occupied by tumor cells uh, with associated intratumoral and the contiguous peritumoral stroma where the inflammatory cells are present. So, so it, if it is more than 10% IC, so this will be given as a positive uh, for SP142. Uh, so uh, here IC scoring is uh, scored as the top, uh, proportion of a tumor area that is occupied by pdl one staining immune cells of any intensity and any immune cell staining irrespective of any type of cells or localization is included. And coming to the uh, CPS scoring, what we call it as a com uh, combined positive score. So this is specifically um, uh, given in, case in uh, 22C3HCSS. Uh, where uh, the numerator will be the PDL1 staining cells, like uh, along with tumor cells, other in inflammatory cells like lymphocytes and macrophages, divided by total number of viable tumor cells into 100. So, this CPS with respect to non small cell lung cancer, it is not applicable. So, it is mainly uh, applicable uh, in other non pulmonary tumors. So, this slide I've just shown. Uh, to see the expression. So on the right side, this is a complete negative, no staining on the tumor cells. So if it is less than one, we give it as no expression. One to 49, so uh, here weak to moderate or any, any intensity uh, staining. Uh, if it is less than 50, then we give it as a low expression. And uh, if it is strong, or it can be either any weak, moderate, or strong. If it constitutes more than 50% of the entire tumor area uh, evaluated, so then we give it as high PDL1 expression. This applies to uh, PDL1 expression by 22C3 as well as to SP263. So, coming to scoring of PDL1 uh, with respect to the SP142 clone. So here, as I said earlier, uh, tumor cell staining also is uh, uh, checked. And if there is no tumor cell staining, then we, we need to concentrate on the immune cell areas. Uh, so mainly in the tumoral and the peritum uh, intratumoral as well as the peritumoral stroma where they are accumulated. Uh, so sorry to interrupt, but uh, we are running short of time. So kindly yes. conclude your talk. Yes, yes, okay. Yeah, just give me two minutes. Um, yeah, if IC is more than, this is the right side is the IC staining with more than 10%, which we give it as positive. So some pre-analytical factors, uh, the tissues uh, and blocks should receive should be FFP, uh, formal fixed and paraffin embedded, and uh, archival tissues, it should be less than three years. Uh, and fresh tissues in the form of resections, excisions, and biopsies are also accepted. Primary and metastatic sites, we evaluate. And adequacy for at least 100 viable tumor cells for SP263 and 22C3, and only 50 viable tumor cells for SP142 staining. And cell blocks are also effective, uh, except in SP142, we, uh, it's not an acceptable sample because we require stroma, which is uh, deficient in cases of cell blocks. Uh, cytology samples and decalcified tissues we are not accepting. And just uh, uh, I need to share the, uh, I'll be sharing our genome experience uh, on PDL1 staining. So uh, this is a five year data with, we have until now reported 3,559 non-small cell lung cancer uh, with PDL1 testing. So this is the trend. And uh, the, yeah, with respect to PDL1 263, so our positive percentage more than 50% is coming around 15 to 20% in, in, in the Indian context uh, data. So uh, 22C3, more than 50% is 22% is our positive percentage rate. And uh, SP142, it's about 40%. And uh, for effective uh, reporting and screening for PDL1, which is a uh, targetable biomarker mainly for uh, immunotherapy. So uh, proficiency testing also needs uh, an important uh, plays an important role. So we have enrolled for PDL1 uh, uh, CAP proficiency testing program, which is an external quality assessment scheme. So in the past five years, we have uh, uh, completely scored 100% in the assessment of PDL1 staining. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Suguchi and Dr. Sayyid. Uh, if there is any question, we can take quickly. I have posted four questions in chat yes. box. So, yes. uh, because we are short of time, if you can answer in the chat box. If any other 
uh, panelist has a question, then we can take in some time. Okay, okay, sure. Okay. Sure. 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 Uh, uh, just TMB question, I would like to answer yeah, quickly. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, TMB cutoffs are not uh, tumor type specific, uh, uh, doctor. It is like uh, I think it's like assay specific. There are various studies uh, that uh, that has been done on the concordance of different assays. And Foundation One, uh, they they rate a high tumor burden from like nine to twenty cutoff, MSK impact above seven, and WES profiling above above fifteen. Ours is uh, optimized at 15 uh, uh, cutoff, like above 15, it is high. Okay, so the question was largely because uh, all tumor types, the TMB cutoff uh, of uh, say 10 or 15, whatever is there, uh, clinical benefit is not same across all the tumor types. That is what uh, I have read. So that was the yes. reason why I asked. Yes, yes. There are multiple other reasons. Uh, there are there is a very small group of, of patients where the response in immunotherapy is seen due to various other factors as well. Okay. I think uh, that is the reason. Sure, sure. So uh, if you can put answers on chat box for the remaining yes, question, we will uh, move ahead with the next talk. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Akhil Kapoor, Associate Professor at TMH Varanasi and a good friend. Uh, to talk on systemic therapy sequencing in early stage resectable NSCLC, new adjuvant and adjuvant, uh, especially from IO perspective. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Risha Boss, for giving me this opportunity. So I will be quickly looking at the data and the data is huge and uh, we will keep it with. So NSCT was an adjuvant, it is a uh, token of the hour and when we see the data, we become perplexed whether to take new adjuvant, whether to take adjuvant, everything, uh, data for everything is now available. You need to choose and choosing wisely remains the key. So early stage, despite why we need treatment, uh, new adjuvant or adjuvant, because we know even in uh, early stage of disease, the survivals are not crossing seven to eight years. That means at least 20% patients uh, will not survive uh, well, uh, more than five years, even at stage one. So that is an important point. This is a staging. I'm not going to the detail. If we see the perspective for a perioperative system treatment, this is the stages where there is a definitely a role of early uh, treatment in the perioperative setting. It includes stage one B onwards and definitely stage three. A. So this is for the perioperative treatment. Adjoint treatment for a stage three treatment, I'm not discussing. This is the overall survival. Even for the stage 1A disease, the survival is 82% at five years. That means 18% patients are not surviving. And this is dropping down to 36% uh, for stage 3A. So that means a significant big chunk of patients are not surviving even at five years, even when they are presenting at early stage. So definitely new adjuvant versus adjuvant. This is the perioperative treatment. And we know surgery is definitely removing the bulk of the tumor, but microscopic disease, which is remaining, is important to be removed by the new adjuvant or adjuvant approach. New adjuvant approach, we have, uh, have discussed, we are discussing this from the time of breast cancer, uh, where we discuss new adjuvant treatment. It has the potentiality to uh, eliminate live tumor cells, which are released during circulation, during surgery, and adjuvant treatment is, uh, uh, what is the advantage? It has the advantage that patient can undergo surgery very uh, at the onset directly. So this is the lung adjuvant cisplatin evaluation. This we have or we have uh, uh, knowing from the time of our DM training that patients more than four centimeter get the maximum benefit, and that is why it is the standard of care. Even in new adjuvant treatment for the chemotherapy, the part is known. If for coming for the EGFR, since it, EGFR is uh, we are not focusing on EGFR today, but this is very important data. Just I wanted to highlight it. Adora it clearly showed adjuvant uh, osimertinib is. Uh, uh, causing hazard ratio up to 0.17. So this is very important. Let's move towards uh, uh, IO approach. Definitely, it is important to be noted that uh, uh, patients, even in EGFR positive, there is some role of uh, uh, new adjuvant treatment. What is the importance? Because uh, now new order study is also ongoing, and that has started to enroll patients even in our country. And uh, EGFR positive patients, we know that chemo and immuno do not work too much well. That is why most of the study try to exclude it, but we'll see the data for this investment. So yes, EGFR, it is clear. It is causing very significant benefit, at least in the terms of DFS and uh, OS data is being avoided. 
So let's take the immunotherapy as peripheral treatment in EGFR negative population. So this is the pivotal study, I am power 010. Let's see the study design. The patients receive adjuvant chemotherapy for one to four cycles. This is what I wanted to highlight. All the studies, even Odora, they have tried to give the adjuvant chemotherapy, complete the adjuvant treatment, and then start uh, the treatment with either, either immunotherapy or targeted treatment. So no study has tried to uh, exclude uh, adjuvant chemotherapy. But the, in reality, as discussed, adjuvant chemotherapy is received by at least only 50% of the patient who are the candidate for the same. This is a very uh, important uh, point to be noted. They do not receive adjuvant chemotherapy due to risk of various complications and various logistic concerns. So in this study, patient received 16 cycles of adjuvant atezo versus supportive care alone. And primary endpoint was hierarchical evaluation of DFS in three population. We'll see the stage two to three A with pd tumor risk, tumor proportion score of more than 1% was the first. And later on, they evaluated OS as well. So uh, these two third were male, two third were non squamous and two third were white population. Stage 1B around 12%, 40 to 45% stage 2 and 3A. PDL1 1% uh, more were 55%. To be noted, EGFR positive were 11%, L positive were 3.3%. So these are the subgroups which are we have highlighted. If we see the um, uh, stratified hazard ratio in the primary endpoint, that is the DFS in stage 2 to 3A with PDL1 PC score more than 1%, hazard ratio 0.66. So if we directly see the 3 year survivals, uh, DFS survival, it is 48% versus 60%. So it is clear it is seeming to be benefiting the patients, and this is very clear. Uh, whether it is benefiting the patient with EGFR mutation, we cannot say because uh, this was a small percentage, 11% only, 43%. But still in this subgroup also, the, uh, the diamond was towards the left. That is in be benefit of ATIZO. This uh, we will not be sure to use it. But if we have no better options, for example, till the time new Adora data does not come out, we can uh, utilize this treatment as well. And if we see the data uh, overall other uh, patients, so all the patients, the curve is towards the left only, whichever chemotherapy is being used, whether patients are not positive or not negative, all patients, it is towards the left. And if we see the all patients, irrespective of the PDL1 status, again, there is uh, improvement in the DFS. It is uh, some definitely lesser in P, uh, PDL1 uh, unmatched patients. It is 49 versus 55% as against 48% versus 61%. So yes, the quantum of benefit reduces in non pdl one selected patients. Again, if we see the pdl one positive patients, yes, pdl more than 50% patients are seeming to get the maximum benefit, hazard ratios towards less than 0.5. So again, we know pdl one more than 50% as in case of metastatic setting is able to select the patients for getting the maximum benefit for this treatment. So this uh, is the subgroup, which is where we should be very uh, 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 enthusiastic to use the treatment. If we see the pd one less than percent, is it uh, exactly at one? So again, it is an important point. pd one less than percent, though the study uh, and the endpoints included uh, pd one unselected population as well, but the primary endpoint was pd one more than one percent, and they, that is why uh, we think this study came as positive, and it is very clear. So well, these are the various subgroup analysis. Let's move ahead. This is the early OS data. There is some benefit in terms of ATIZO. Uh, OS data is definitely immature presently and it is not reaching 50%. If we see the safety data, yes, it is, seems to be quite safe. We have our experience with utilizing immunotherapy in a lot of patients. And definitely the benefit is maximum in PDL more than 50%. Yes, finances are an issue. Uh, can we restrict it to patient with maximum benefit? Yes, I think so. PDL1 more than 50%, I will be more happy to utilize these immunotherapy, which are the costly treatment options. Well, uh, if we see there is AMA approval in uh, uh, for uh, stage 2 to 3A, PDL1 more than 50%, FDA approval is more than 1%. So your European countries are have stronger, stricter approvals, and we can clearly see it is the subgroup which is getting the maximum benefit. That is uh, more than 50% PDL1 and EGFR alpha negative. It seems that we can adopt the same criteria in our settings as well. This is other data, adjuvant PEMBRO data. Uh, we'll not take it up in detail, but definitely hazard ratio of 0.6 again. So it seems to be working well. And the benefit with uh, PDL1 uh, more than 50% was uh, again somewhat higher, but it was not so pronounced as case in the ATIZO data. This is uh, might be due to smaller sample size. So 
again uh, let's come to some other uh, treatment options first uh, this was about adjuvant treatment the problem with adjuvant treatment you have to go at least 16 cycles of treatment while in new adjuvant setting only four cycles are usually in a four to five cycles we'll come to just that data as well so um, this is the new adjuvant data this is checkmate 816 pathological response survival study the it is clearly utilizing patients uh, nivolumab three weekly uh, versus uh, standard chemotherapy patient underwent surgery within six weeks post treatment and optional adjuvant treatment so if we see a uh, 16 percent patient could not undergo a definitive surgery but this might happen even in patients who are planned for surgery and do not receive new adjuvant treatment this is very common uh, all patients who are planned for treatment do not undergo surgery this is important if we see the path cr rate the patient who achieved path cr they were having a very, very extraordinary benefit. Neo plus chemo is able to uh, shift the curve in terms of benefit with path CR patients. The curve shifts to hazard ratio of 0.18. So that means the patients who are having path CR with Neo plus immuno, they are getting the maximum, maximum benefit. They are predicting as good survival as with the new Adora data, with Adora data. So definitely path CR, if patients are giving major path, pathological response or path CR, they are the subgroups which we can predict to be having maximum benefit. So it is important. Uh, this is a good option where surgery might be challenging and relapses are high and the long-term DFS and OS are awaited. But uh, there is for more data, NADIM study is also there, uh, where path CR rates are close to the tune of 63%. So yeah. there is difference in the outcomes. It is to be noted. Uh, there are more data which is awaited uh, and this is the guidelines. So, so to just conclude in brief, there is absence of direct comparison between new adjuvant and adjuvant immunotherapy. Both are valid options for different patient subset where there is a uh, potentially resectable or questionable fitness for surgery. Better to go ahead with new adjuvant treatment. Other another advantage with new adjuvant immunotherapy, the cost will be less because patient will receive only four to five cycles. Patients who have under, uh, those have a smaller disease at the baseline, they can undergo resection first. Those who have negative margins and adequate fitness can undergo adjuvant chemotherapy followed by immunotherapy. With this, I again reiterate, choosing wisely remains the key and we need to uh, choose the best treatment for our patients. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, lecture by Dr. Akhil Kapoor. Uh, now our uh, uh, next speaker uh, will be uh, Dr. Arun Chandrasekharan uh, from Kerala and he will speak on uh, uh, a role of Dualimab in stage 3 uh, non small cell lung cancer, increasing hope for the cure. Uh, so over to Dr. Arun. Yeah, thank you for that. I'll just share my screen. Um, I hope it's visible. Yes, yeah. sir. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Rushab and Ampu for the invite. And thank you, AstraZeneca is a sponsored session. So we'll be speaking uh, specifically about the role of druvalumab in stage 3 non-small cell lung cancer. So the slides have been provided by AstraZeneca. So uh, this is the mandatory slide, which tells us about the burden of lung cancer. It is the second most common uh, cause of cancer within India. And if you see the number of cancer deaths is quite high. It's almost, uh, from the when you look at the incidence, it's almost 90% of the patients, they, uh, when you look at the incidence, almost 90% numbers, they end up dying of the disease. So it's a highly lethal cancer. And uh, the treatment of uh, lung cancer is, requires multiple doctors, multiple sessions in the tumor board. And in specifically for stage three non-small cell lung cancer, after the patient is evaluated by all the doctors, including the radiation oncologist, the medical oncologist, the pulmonologist, and the surgeon, uh, they do various tests to look at the pulmonary function tests, the bronchoscopy, mediastinal node evaluation, MRI, and PET scan for complete staging. And if a patient is deemed unresectable stage three, in that case, the standard of care as of now is definitive chemo radiation for that patient, provided he can tolerate the treatment. In some patients who have poor performance status or who uh, you end up giving too much radiation to the lung, in such cases, there is an option where you can shrink the tumor with uh, chemotherapy and then go ahead with chemo radiation. But the best form of treatment still remains concurrent chemo radiation rather than the sequential chemo radiation. 
So uh, if you look at the uh, various regimens which are there in uh, uh, in the use of concurrent uh, chemo radiation, uh, earlier there was cisplatin and etoposide in the pro proclaim trials, and the newer proclaim trials have used cisplatin plus uh, pemetrexid. We have the age-old paclitaxel plus carboplatin. And with all these treatments, if you see the median uh, progression-free survival is around 10 months and the median overall survival comes to around 22 to 25 months. So this has remained static more or less, even with newer chemo regimens being used. But if you use sequential regimens where you give chemo first and then radiation, the survival is much lesser with overall survival only 15 months. So concurrent is better than sequential. Now, however, uh, as shown before, the survival is only 25 months. So even when you give concurrent chemo radiation with curative intent, almost 50% uh, of the patients will develop distant metastasis and 40% will develop local regional metastasis. And the total five-year overall survival is roughly in the tune of 15 to 25%. So there is definitely an unmet need, need and uh, there has been studies to improve these outcomes. So uh, various trials have looked at adding to chemo radiation using some form of consolidation to improve survival. So they've used chemotherapy, they've used targeted therapy and uh, vaccines as well, immunological agents. But all these agents have not been able to breach that 25 month overall survival mark. Most of them are still in that area. So what, what all these studies which have uh, looked at consolidation could not show a definitive improvement in PFS and OS. So if you look at the, event, the evolution of treatment, the earliest studies started off with the usage of just radiation in the 1960s. And then they looked at sequential chemo radiation where they give chemo and then radiation. And they found that that was better than radiation alone. Then came concurrent chemo radiation versus radiation, and there was survival gain of over 10 months in those patients. And to improve on that, they kept studying and they compared concurrent chemo radiation versus sequential chemo radiation, which we discussed earlier, where concurrent chemo radiation is much better than sequential chemo radiation. They also looked at induction chemo radiation followed by uh, radiation. Oh, sorry, okay, uh, induction chemo radiation followed by surgery versus chemo radiation alone. And that also did not show much difference in survival. Various consolidation regimens were also used as we saw in the previous slide. And that also could not improve survival. So we've largely remained static over the last, let's say, 20 years from 1992 onwards. So, uh, in spite of you know all these tests, because of this negative outcomes, people were looking for newer treatment options, and that's when immunotherapy was looked at to see whether it would be a safe and effective option, and it could be used along with uh, concurrent chemo radiation or sequential after that as a consolidation regimen. So there comes the uh, Pacific trial, and the Pacific trial basically recruited patients with. Uh, stage three unresectable lung cancer. So this was a phase three randomized double blind placebo controlled multicentric study. And patients who are 18 years or older with good performance status and within life expectancy of more than three months, such patients were taken in and randomized two is to one. And they were randomized and included in the trial within the first six weeks after completion of radiation. One arm received rivulumab every two weeks at 10 milligram per kg for 12 months and the other arm received a placebo every two weeks. Patients were, ran, are, were stratified based on the age, sex and smoking history. The primary endpoints were both PFS by blinded independent central review and overall survival. You had other endpoints like uh, ORR, the duration of response, safety and tolerability and so on. So if you look at the baseline characteristics between both arms, they fit the typical lung cancer population. Points of note are one, the Asian population was almost 25 to 30 patient, to 30% in both arms, which is a sizable number. So you can say this uh, study is reflective of practices in Asia as well. 
The other thing is EGFR mutation status was positive in around 6% of the population. And uh, it was not tested in almost 25% of the population. So as we know, this is the population where immunotherapy may not have that much of uh, activity because there are other driver mutations, but a small percentage, 6% did have this. In. The other baseline characteristics were of importance is the PDL1 expression in which uh, a TC score of less than 25% was seen in almost 40%. More than 25% was seen in around 20% of the population and it was unknown in 35%. So you can say that the majority had a low PDL1 expression and histology, both squamous and non squamous, were equally distributed and majority were obviously smokers. Almost 75% of patients were smokers. Uh, the prior chemotherapy received, almost 100% received concurrent chemo radiation. And almost 25%, roughly around one fourth of the patients, received induction chemotherapy. So this is uh, this is interesting because uh, these patients would have received, you know, slightly different regimens than many others. Uh, but it goes to say that uh, it, this trial looked at the effect of immunotherapy in that population as well. So moving on, uh, just to look at that subgroup again, this is slide highlights that. Uh, as we said, chemoradiation was received in the majority and induction chemotherapy was there in 26.8% of the population. Now, this is the updated five-year survival of the Pacific trial. And as you can see, the curves remain separate after you know, the end of five years with a difference of 42.9% versus 33%, almost a 10 percentage difference. And if you look at the median overall survival, it's 47.5 months versus 29.1 months of the placebo. So that's almost an 18 month survival or one and a half months, uh, sorry, one and a half years survival benefit with the use of Druvilumab as consolidation. So that's quite good. The hazard ratio is quite decent at 0.72 as well. So this is the first and only approved immunotherapy in stage three unresectable lung cancer which is giving you an overall survival of 42.9. It's almost 43% at five years. If you remember the old data, the range was from 15 to 25%. So we are almost able to double the survival from the old data. If you look at the progression-free survival here, this is also uh, you know, superior with the use of Rivalumab. It's almost 17 months of progression-free benefit versus 5.6 months in the placebo. So both these endpoints, the primary endpoints were satisfied and met, and this drug was obviously FDA approved. And as we see, the progression-free survival at five years is 33.1%. What about subsequent therapy? So uh, uh, as in real-world practice, in the Druvalumab arm, 41% of the patients received subsequent treatment and 54% of the patients in the placebo arm received subsequent therapy. So there are many dropouts because of you know progression of disease and patients' performance status being quite bad that they're not able to receive subsequent therapy, but it's largely balanced between the both arms. And what were the subsequent therapies received? The majority was a platinum doublet chemotherapy. And then you had use of immunotherapy. Obviously, the placebo arm or the you know the control arm received more immunotherapy because the other arm was already exposed to drivenumab. So 13% of patients did receive immunotherapy. This number is a little lesser than expected, but probably, you know, depends on various factors and accessibility. But yeah, and uh, some more patients could have received immunotherapy in the control arm as well. Other than that, targeted therapy was given in around 5% of the population. So subsequent therapy has been described and, you know, uh, detailed in the uh, updated analysis. Now, what about the site of progression? How do these patients progress with their disease? So the, uh, in Juvelumab arm, there was reduced rates of first progression, obviously. And the most common site of progression was intrathoracic, which is the same area which you treated. 80% versus placebo 74.5%. This table shows uh, highlights the same thing. Uh, which says that the majority of the progression is 80% has been seen in the intrathoracic uh, area. 
Now, this is the time to intrathoracic progression, which is just basically giving you more information specifically to you know the local progression. It's something similar to the progression pre survival. So the time to intrathoracic progression was almost 25.2 months versus 9.2 months with the placebo. So Druvulumab help will help you reduce the intrathoracic progression. So the symptomatology, the breathlessness, those kind of symptoms can be obviously reduced with the use of Druvulumab. If you look at extra thoracic lesions, there is obviously Druvulumab perform better and only 8.8% .8 had extra thoracic lesions. And the majority of the patients, as you can see here, had one to two extra thoracic lesions on first progression. Safety-wise, majority of patients in both arms, almost 96%, both of them had some side effect or the other. Grade 5 side effects were more in the placebo arm, 6.4% versus 4.4%. So this is important because 5% of your population are going to die you in the end, you know, within five years because of, you know, some form of chemotoxicity or, you know, drug toxicity. Discontinuation rates were 15% versus 10% in uh, the placebo arm and serious adverse events were 30%. Now, if you look at the most important side effect, which we worry about with immunotherapy and the use of radiation together, especially with CTRT in lung is pneumonitis. Now, any grade pneumonitis was seen in almost 34% of the population versus 24%. So even the placebo arm had a high level probably because of the post-radiation pneumonitis which was there. 10% higher with the use of drivulumab because of the additional effect of immunotherapy. In that, grade 5 was 1.1% versus 2.1%. And grade 3 and 4 was 3 versus 3%. And more patients had to discontinue drivulumab because of this pneumonitis. So uh, the rough, uh, roughly this tells you that one third of your patients will develop pneumonitis. So you have to keep a lookout for that. Keep the pulmonologist in the loop. And I would say probably keep looking at uh, pulmonary function tests or you know do CT scans if you have a doubt of pneumonitis. Now, if you look at the safety based on time from radiation, this slide basically looks at the aspect of whether starting immunotherapy earlier, like within two weeks of radiation, could cause more harm versus starting immunotherapy after two weeks of radiation. So as you can see, uh, 39, almost 40% of patients developed some form of pneumonitis when you did it within two weeks versus 32% after two weeks. So uh, for safety-wise, I think it's safer to start immunotherapy at least two weeks after the last dose of uh, radiation. It's slightly, it's almost comparable numbers, but slightly less chances of pneumonitis you'll have starting after two weeks. So uh, is that data on uh, real-world data regarding the use of drivulumab? Yes, this is one of the uh, French uh, studies. And this also looked at the timing of the start of drivulumab. And this was... Uh, study in which this drug was given a special temporary authorization for use in France. And 561 patients were given this drug. These were patients who were not enrolled in other clinical trials and who deserved the medication. So the eligibility criteria was stage 3 non-small cell lung cancer who were not in any other trial and who did not have any disease progression after chemo radiation. And they should have received at least two cycles of platinum-based chemo radiation. Their radiation doses have also been specified and with good performance status. And it had to be started within six weeks of drivulum, means within six weeks of the completion of radiation. The exclusion criteria was unresolved grade three or four toxicity, grade two pneumonitis, even persistent after six weeks, or if they received prior immunotherapy, or if they had any immune syndrome history. So, this is, I think, uh, very important because these are the patients where you should avoid. Uh, drivulumab, you still have significant pneumonitis or you have good toxicity or if you have severe immune conditions which are not controlled. So the patient characteristics were basically very similar to that which is there in the Pacific trial, nothing uh, major to highlight there. And uh, in while when the patients were enrolled into the study, almost 78% had partial response with just chemo radiation. 15% had stable disease and 6% had complete response. 
the interval between the end of chemo radiation and start of rivulumab was less than two weeks for a very small proportion, 2.5%. The majority received it between that two weeks to six weeks. And it was almost six, more than six weeks in 40% of the population. So even after six weeks, a, a large number, 40% of the patients took rivulumab. And what they looked at is the data of the available 360 patients. And what they found out is the disease control rates, complete response, partial responses, all of them were more or less comparable to the Pacific trial. So even if patients got enrolled into it after six weeks of therapy, you could almost get the same outcomes as you see in the Pacific trial. And this tells you that you can use Druvalumab. Suppose you have a patient with some form of pneumonitis, which is slowly resolving. So even after six weeks, maybe if you take a two, three week extra break and then start immunotherapy, you can probably continue it. But definitely you'll have to keep monitoring for any worsening of pneumonitis. So this is what this data, it's real world data, it's not randomized, but it gives you a possibility of use. So finally, to conclude, uh, the use of Druvalumab slowly, as we said, from 15 to 25%, the survival is going up to 40, uh, 43%. So the aim was to uh, almost make lung cancer a chronic disease and, you know, the patient taking some form of treatment or the other, but, you know, the disease kept in control. That is the final aim of, you know, the treatment of this undisectable lung cancer. So the final takeaway messages are the overall survival in the Pacific trial was 47.5 months versus 29 months for placebo, a good hazard ratio of 0.68. Progression-free survival of 17 months versus 5.6 months. All subgroups benefited from treatment. Uh, although I think the EGFR mutated arm did not do well that much. So it's good to look at that for any driver mutations before proceeding with immunotherapy. The five-year overall survival, 43%. Uh, mean, sorry, the percentage survival is uh, five-year OS is uh, 43%, which is quite good. And almost uh, one third of your patients that remain alive free and uh, free of disease progression. That's your PFS benefit is almost 33% at the end of five years with the use of Druvalumab as consolidation. And uh, obviously intrathoracic progression is uh, the main site of failure, but it's much lesser than placebo. It's decently tolerated. Look out for pneumonitis. 30% of your population, one third will develop pneumonitis. And even if you want to start the drug after six weeks, there is some uh, data for it. So it can be offered after that as well. I think that's the last slide. Thank you for your patient list. Thank you, Arun, for your uh, excellent lecture. Now we'll move on to the other lecture. Uh, our uh, next speaker is Dr. Vipul Dosi. Uh, he's a consultant medical oncologist from Solapur. And uh, he will speak on uh, IO versus combined IO as a first line therapy. So over to Dr. Vipul. Uh, thank you, Gaurav. Uh, I would like to thank organizers for giving me an opportunity to express my thoughts on the first line in metastatic NS NSCLC role of the chemo immunotherapy alone or a immuno, immuno combination. Uh, so let me share my screen. So today, uh, we till now we have discussed the role oh, of immunotherapy. Sir, sorry to interrupt. Can you make it full screen, sir, please? Uh, I already have. I'll make it again. Yeah, please, sir. Ah, is it full screen now? Uh, no, sir. Oh my God. Sir, uh, close your PPT and reopen your PPT again, sir, please. But yeah. Okay. 
Uh, is it full on full screen? Is it done now? Uh, no, so support team, can you please help? Yes. Uh, sir, just uh, click uh, click on the F five. F five. Okay. Is it full screen now? Because my my laptop it looks as a full screen only. Sir, आपका full screen हो रहा है लेकिन इधर नहीं दिखता है वो. Okay. So, what else I can do? So you can start. No issue, sir. Okay. so i'll be discussing about uh, immunotherapy uh, alone or immuno immuno combination in the first line of metastatic non small cell lung cancer so let us look at the what are the fda approved indications for using met, uh, new immunotherapy in uh, metastatic nsclc that is uh, nivolumab ipilimumab combination for the first line in metastatic nsclc with the pdl1 percentage more than 1% without egf or alk, alk mutation and it has been also approved with the combination with the two cycles of platinum doublet chemotherapy regardless of pdl1 status There is another molecule, atezolizumab, which has been approved in the first line uh, setting. Uh, alone, when the PDL1 expression is more than 50% of tumor cells or tumor infiltrating immune cells covering the 10, more than 10% of tumor area, it also has been approved along with the combination of the bevacizumab and paclitaxel carbovirin, that is ABCP regimen in a non-squamous uh, with the no EGFR mutation. And it also has been approved in a non-squamous with NAP paclitaxel along with the carboplatin without EGFR alk mutation. Even uh, pembrolizumab has been approved in the first line uh, setting uh, with the pemetrexide and platinum chemotherapy with the metastatic non-squamous without EGFR alk mutation. It also has been approved in a combination with carboplatin either pacly or NAP pacly in a squamous uh, metastatic cancer. And it also has been approved uh, with NSCLC expressing PDL1. uh dps score more than 1% without any egfr alk mutation so uh, let us go into the details of these studies which has made this uh, uh, immunotherapy combinations has been approved in the first line so i'll be discussing only uh, immunotherapy uh, alone or immuno immunotherapy combinations in the first line the immuno chemo combination has been discussed by samir in uh, further sessions so first uh, the role of the first line nivo ep combination versus with chemotherapy came from the checkmate 227 trial uh, for the background nivo and ep are have distinct but complementary mechanism of action when they combine they can prolong long term survival as seen in melanoma rcc and nsclc nivolumab targets pdl1 and ct uh, ipilimumab targets ct la4 so thus checkmate 227 randomized phase 3 trial for the first line nivolumab based therapy versus chemotherapy in advanced nsclc uh, it has part 1 and part 2 part 1 showed that nivo ipilimumab significantly prolonged overall survival versus chemotherapy in newly diagnosed when the pdl1 score is more than 1% and it also has uh, uh, some pre specified descriptor analysis even less than 1% has shown some benefit as well uh, this current uh, st uh, study reports three year updated survival from this uh, os so in a checkmate 227 stage 4 recurrent uh, nsclc without any prior systemic therapy without any egfr alk mutation with the ps021 part 1a was uh, with the pdl1 expression more than 1% which has received either nivolumab ipilimumab combination uh, or a chemotherapy which was uh, based on a histology or a nivo nivolumab alone and it was a part 1b when the pdl1 expression was less than 1% the baseline uh, characteristic were uh, very well matched in a nivo ep and a chemotherapy arm um, in uh, in uh, in sake of performance status smoking histology and a pdl1 expression so this is an updated 3 year os update uh, where the nivo ep combination had a median overall survival of 17.1 month as compared to chemotherapy alone it was 14.9 months so thus there is 3 months roughly around 3 months improvement in overall survival so uh, uh, median overall survival as we already have discussed 17.1 months versus 14.9 median progression free survival was uh, 5.1 and 5.6 months and there was one more important median duration of the response in a month it was 23.2 months as compared to 6.7 months so uh, as a safety summary uh, as we can see the the 
immunotherapy related autoimmune side effects are usually common across these scenarios but there are no new safety signals observed across the 3 year analysis and the incidence of of side effects are more during the first 6 months of therapy which included skin endocrine gi hepatic adverse effect and most frequent uh, most frequently when the incidence is more than 10% but after the 6 month the freak, there was no event occurring at frequency more than 10% so to conclude first line nivo ep continued to provide a durable clinical benefit to patients with advanced nsclc when compared to platinum based chemo regardless of pdl1 expression at 3 year minimum follow up when the os for pdl1 more than 1% hazard ratio is 0.79 os for pdl1 less than 1% hazard ratio is 0.64 objective response rate at 6 month associated with better 3 year survival outcomes with nivo ep versus chemotherapy 3 year os for responders at 6 month when pdl1 is more than 1% is 70% with nivo ep combo as compared to 40 with chemotherapy alone and 3 year os rate for responders at 6 months with pdl1 less than 1% 82% with nivo ep versus 25% with chemotherapy there was no new safety signals emerged and thus investigator concluded that nivo ep represent novel chemotherapy sparing first line treatment of advanced nsclc Uh, let us go through what do we have uh, evidence for atezolizumab as uh, as decided by the empower 110 tar which was for squamous as well as uh, non squamous nsclc where atezolizumab monotherapy compared with the platinum doublet pemetrexid or gemcitabine along with the platinum agent in first line nsclc so empower 110 randomized phase 3 multi center study stage 4 non squamous or squamous pdl1 selected egfr alk negative uh, Stratified on the basis of the sex, echo, histology, and PDL1 expression. Randomized to one is to one fashion to atezolizumab versus pemetrexid cisplatin in non-squamous, uh, gemcitabine uh, cisplatin carboplatin in uh, squamous variety, and it has been continued till progression. And the primary endpoint was overall survival, and the key secondary endpoint were PFS or overall response rates and duration of response rates. So expression of PDL1 status in Empire 110. was tc3 that is uh, more than 50% of tumor cells or more than 10% of immune cells covering the tumor area was 36 uh, 38 and 36% or for the more than 5% it was uh, 59 58% <clears throat> and uh, including all it was almost uh, 100% so we we'll let let us look at the overall survival in high pdl1 expressing population that is tc3 or ic3 uh, where the overall survival, median overall survival was 20.2 months compared to 13.1 months when the pdl1 expression is more than 50% or immune cell expression is more than 10% in atezolizumab mark compared with the chemotherapy alone similar improvement we can see in the progression free survival also in the high pdl1 expressing arm it was uh, For five months for chemotherapy and eight point one month for atezolizumab. As uh, it also has a, a good improved uh, overall response rates and a median duration of response rates are also better seen with the PDL one expression in high in atezolizumab arm versus chemotherapy. As uh, side effect profile is uh, common as seen with the other immunotherapy trials. To summarize, Empower one hundred and ten. Atezolizumab represent promising first line treatment option with a PDL1 high NSCLC. It is a positive study demonstrated statistically significant improvement in overall survival uh, in a high TC3 or IC3 uh, population. Atezolizumab shown in improvement in PFS overall survival and duration of response versus chemotherapy, and uh, it has a favorable safety profile. And patient treated with atezolizumab treat, uh, treatment exposure then. better with the chemotherapy alone uh, for uh, uh, pembrolizumab we have a prior trial keynote 24 which has uh, uh, more than uh, 50% of pdl1 score has shown improvement in uh, overall survival as compared to chemotherapy alone when the pdl1 percentage is more than uh, 50% in this keynote 42 study pembrolizumab versus platinum based chemotherapy with pdl1 uh, tps score more than 1% in, Uh, for the background pembrolizumab was a standard of care in untreated and previously treated advanced metastatic nsclc ketone keynote 10 shows pembrolizumab monotherapy improved os 
versus docetaxel who has progressed on platinum containing chemotherapy you know 24 as we already have told you pimrozumab monotherapy improved pfs and os and better safety profile when uh, pdl1 score is more than 50% and kinot 189 and 407 membranes have combined with the chemotherapy has improved survival outcomes as compared to chemotherapy alone so this is kinot 42 trial efficacy uh, it has been the study design was uh, one is one is to one with the advanced beta static nsclc pps score more than or equal to one no egfr alp mutation no untreated cns metastasis no prior pneumonitis requiring steroids so compared pembrolizumab 203 weekly for 35 cycle that is for 2 years and platinum chemotherapy up to 6 cycles followed by uh, pemetrexid maintenance in a case of non squamous nsclc primary endpoint was os in pdl1 tps score more than 50% 20% and more than 1% in overall population and the secondary endpoint for pss overall response rates and duration of response rates as we can see the baseline patient characteristics were very well matched across the two groups including the prior treatment as well as the pdl1 status and a histology uh, if we see at the overall response uh, overall survival rate with the pdl1 tps is more than 1% is uh, 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 median to 16.7 months compared to 12.1 months with chemotherapy alone when a tps score is more than 1% when a tps score is more than 50% it is the median overall survival is 17.7 months uh, um so uh, 17% month as compared to 13 months and when the tps score is more than 50% the survival median overall survival is 20 months as compared to 12 months in uh, chemotherapy alone uh, similar uh, uh, benefit can be seen in uh, uh, similar benefit not seen when the uh, pdl1 score is 1 to 49 percentage uh, the progression free survival is uh, more than 1% is uh, almost similar uh, but progression free survival in a tps score more than 50% and more than 20% was slightly better uh, no new safety signals were noted uh, there were routine autoimmune chemotherapy side effects were noted so to conclude in a patients with advanced metastatic nsclc without egfr alk mutation with a tps score more than 1% first line pembrolizumab improved overall survival <coughs> with versus platinum based chemotherapy benefit was greater when the level of pdl1 expression was high more than 50% more than 20% uh, there was no significant improvement in pfs with the study continuing to evaluate responses were more durable with the pembrolizumab versus chemotherapy at all levels of pdl1 expression side effect uh, with non safety profiles less frequent uh, with the pembrolizumab despite of longer exposures so this data supported an expanded use of pembrolizumab monotherapy as a standard first line of treatment for the pdl1 positive cancers uh, this was an updated uh, at 5 years uh, in intention to treat analysis when the pembrolizumab median overall survival was 20 months when the uh, compared with the 12 12 months when the tps score is more than 50% and a duration of response was also 28 months as compared to 10 months so to conclude in overall for the first line immunotherapy so all metastatic uh, lung cancers which are targetable mutation negative should be evaluated for immunotherapy with the pdl1 testing immunotherapy alone is a good and chemo free option when the pdl expression is high uh, side effect profile with the immunotherapy alone are consistent with the non safety profiles and are safer than chemotherapy and uh, those with the low pdl1 expression can be treated with the chemotherapy combinations thank you thank you sir people for excellent lecture it account for around 18 to 85% of uh, total case of lung cancers around 15% of patients they are non smoker uh, and the median age of drug is around 70 years but india we see that median age is around uh, 55 to 60 years of age and the most cancer they came with the distant mates around uh, my practice i see around 75% patient came with the distant mates and targeted agents uh, we know that the uh, increase the survival uh, in the uh, uh, these patients like initially is were 5.1 month in the supportive care uh, patients uh, to 31.8 months in the targeted era so there is quite uh, evolving uh, ev- evolution in the treatment in the non small carcinoma lung next slide 
so uh, the landscape we see the early 80s and late 90 uh, mid 90s only there is two uh, types of cancer like uh, non small cell or small cell carcinoma lung in non small cell only chemotherapy pecli jam or pemetrexate and uh, in small cell is etoposide cisplatin uh, from mid uh, 90s uh, there is evolution in the histopathology of the uh, non small cell carcinoma lung now we divided adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma and large cell carcinoma so there is evolution in the histopathology and from late uh, uh, 2000s there is a uh, quite uh, uh, remarkable evolution in the treatment path like egfr uh, egfr then al then ros1 then pdl1 so now we are seeing lots of uh, lots of molecules in the uh, uh, non small cell lung next slide I already spoke that uh, the uh, in targeted era the uh, five year survival is increased in this patient like the thirty one point eight months in the MOS now in targeted era patients and five point one in the supportive care patients so there is lo lots of uh, improvement in the uh, OS in these patients and the molecular profiling of this patient is around uh, uh, mostly they are the unknown mutations they are not actionable mutations fifteen percent just fully wild type uh, of uh, tumors. And the EG5 is 11 percent, but in India we see about 30 percent. They are the EG5 uh, positive. Teras is about 29 percent, HRT 1 percent, DERA 2 percent, ALG 5 percent. But mostly they are the non-explainable mutations uh, in the NSCLC. Next slide. So now I discuss uh, the study uh, of IM power 110, uh, 130, and 150. There are some questions related to study like. Is the uh, atlizumab monotherapy is a superior to chemotherapy in uh, PD-11 high uh, adenocarcinoma uh, patients? IM-30 is the steroid sparing chemotherapy with atlizumab is superior to, to the chemotherapy alone. And IM-150 is the addition of atlizumab to chemotherapy plus biocizumab in high PD-11 uh, in non-squamous uh, or non-squamous cell uh, cancer. So next slide. So first is the IM power 110 study is the squamous and non-squamous NACLC. Atrazuma monotherapy uh, compared with the platinum agent cisplatin or colboplatin uh, in NACLC. Next slide. So it's a uh, randomized trial, uh, stage four non-squamous or squamous histology, uh, PD-11 selected patients, EGFR alert negative, and steady vision factors are six, echo uh, uh, histology, PD-11 by ISC expression. And uh, they are uh, randomized in atlizumab uh, monotherapy versus chemotherapy uh, in a, a non squamous is a femi, uh, Texas cis or carbo. In uh, squamous is a gem uh, cis or carbo. In maintenance, uh, in uh, femi texas in the uh, non squamous and uh, the base support in the squamous. And atlizumab is a maintenance therapy. And they divided uh, according to uh, PD-11 uh, staining, like more than 1% uh, or 1 to 5% and 10% uh, IC over TC is uh, more than 1%, 5 to 50% and more than 50%. Next slide. So the prevalence of PD-11 expression uh, is uh, equal uh, to all the group, like 38.6% uh, high uh, PD-11 score. Uh, both uh, uh, chemo and atlizumab uh, group had a uh, equal uh, PD-11 status, like in the TC, uh, more than 5% is the same and uh, uh, more than one percent is the same. So there is uh, equal uh, uh, distribution among the, all the uh, uh, group. Next slide. And the baseline characteristics are the same uh, between two groups, like age, male, white, Asian, never used tobacco, non schematology are the, uh, equally distributed among all the groups. Uh, next slide. So now in this slide, we see that there is uh, always benefit in the uh, atrizumab monotherapy arm compared to chemotherapy arm. 31.1 months in the chemotherapy arm is uh, 20.2 months in the uh, monotherapy uh, atrizumab arm. And the six months OEG are 76.3% uh, uh, in the monotherapy and 70% in the chemo arm. And 12 months OEG is 84.9% in the uh, 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 atrizumab arm and 50.9% is the arm. Um, and the, the OEG benefit is, uh, is seen in all uh, subgroup except the never smoker, uh, never used tobacco group. Otherwise, all the uh, all age factor, female, man, 
ecox it is uh, all uh, favorable to uh, treatment of competitive the uh, chemotherapy next slide and mostly a third of patient uh, in the control arm uh, receive subsequent cancer chemotherapy immunotherapy and we see that there is a uh, immunotherapy is around 28.9% uh, they received in the chemotherapy arm next slide This B uh, clinical BFS uh, benefit in the uh, high uh, PDL1 expression arm. Like there is a 8.1 months PFS in the atrium arm compared to the uh, uh, five uh, months in the uh, chemo arm. And hazard ratio is around 0 .80, uh, 0 0.62. Next slide. I confirmed the ORR is also uh, 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 better in the uh, atrium arm compared to the chemotherapy arm. Now 38.3% in the at the arm compared to the uh, 28 in the uh, chemo arm. Next slide. And the safety profile is uh, mostly equal uh, uh, in the uh, both arm, like the immunotherapy, immune uh, mediated uh, side effects are more in the uh, atrium arm compared to chemotherapy arm. But it's well tolerated uh, monotherapy uh, compared to chemotherapy, and there is no ma major concern except pruritis or uh, or hypothyroidism. Next slide. Like in this slide, the anemia, nausea, omitting, constipation, thrombocytopenia, or decreased platelet count are they common in the chemotherapy arm? Uh, in the uh, immunotherapy arm, the, uh, the increased AST, pruritis, or hypothyroidism, they are common in the uh, 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 immunotherapy arm. Next slide. So in the summary, atrizumab monotherapy is a promising first-line treatment option in patients with PD-11 high uh, NACLC. I have, uh, is a positive study uh, which demonstrated a uh, study significant and clinically meaningful improvement in OS in high uh, PD-11 expression uh, population versus platinum-based chemotherapy. The hazard disclosure 0.59 is comparable to the other immunotherapy like checkmate in the checkmate trial. So it's a compared to other immunotherapy. The safety profile uh, is uh, acceptable, uh, favorable uh, safety profile is there. No new unexpected uh, safety signals were identified. Atrizumab had a favorable safety profile compared to the chemotherapy. And patient treated with atrizumab had a longer treated uh, exposure than patient treated with the chemotherapy. The next slide. Next slide. Now we we'll discuss the IM4150 trial. It's a phase three study of atrizumab plus chemotherapy and biocizumab in first line uh, advanced non-squamous uh, non cell carcinoma lung. Next slide. So uh, uh, it's a phase three study, first line atrizumab plus chemotherapy and biocizumab in non-squamous NACLC. So clinical questions, does the addition of uh, uh, atrizumab to chemotherapy plus biocizumab uh, have some uh, uh, clinical benefit? Or is there, this can replace the uh, biocizumab with the atrizumab in the uh, in these patients? And the atrizumab, uh, carboprotein, biocizumab, and the pemetrexel, or uh, biocizumab, uh, carboprotein, pemetrexel, uh, pemetrexel, these are the insistent one category uh, indications, uh, recommendation for the uh, non squamous cell uh, carcinoma lung. So stage 4 NACLC, uh, chemotherapy naive, uh, stratified spectral sex, pediatric IC expressions, and liver mates. So they are stratified in the three groups, like in liver, meta, liver mates group, the EGFR uh, positive, which treated with prior TK therapy, and third is a bulky disease. So they are evaluation, evaluated all these, uh, uh, fact, uh, all these uh, stratification, and uh, they come to some conclusion. And the first arm is the atrizumab, carbapatine plus pectidexel. Second arm is the atrizumab, carbapatine, pectidexel plus biocizumab. And third arm is the carbapatine, uh, pectidexel and biocizumab. As a maintenance age uh, uh, routine, like atrizumab in the uh, single age atrizumab and atrizumab biocizumab in the biocizumab arm. Next slide. There are some rational uh, so, uh, that why, why we use uh, atrizumab plus biocizumab in these patients. 
so there are some mechanism like bi switch of inhibits bgf mediated suppression of dendritic cell maturation enabling efficient uh, priming and uh, activation of t cell responses chemotherapy induced immunogenic cell death can trigger the release of tumor antigens so there are various hypotheses uh, by which we can uh, add uh, uh, we can there is additive effect of atrizumab plus bisuzumab i will not go uh, into details uh, of this slide uh, next slide so based on characteristics are the uh, well balanced with the two group like 14% of patient had liver metastasis at baseline which uh, were stratification uh, factor in if uh, 50 and stratified between equally between all three groups 10% of patient had egfr mutation mutation which treated uh, by with the tki therapy and they are approximate 50 50 split between pd1 positive and negative patients so the, there is well balanced uh, uh, between all, all three groups next slide So there is significant always uh, benefit with the addition of uh, atrizumab to uh, intent to treat population uh, of wild uh, tumor uh, NACLC like uh, within OAC fourteen point seven months in the uh, uh, in the uh, chemo plus bisuzumab uh, is uh, around nineteen point uh, five months in the atrizumab arm and the hazard ratio is around point uh, eight zero and the days twelve uh, months eighteen months and twenty four months uh, OS is uh, better in the arm B compared to the arm A. The next slide. The improvement. And we are we are seeing that the in all the uh, population interdicted population I P D one or a P D one low group or P D one negative group. There is clear cut benefit of uh, addition of atrizumab to chemotherapy plus bisuzumab, like 58 percent in the uh, interdicted population compared to other arm, and median uh, duration of response is around 11.5 months in the uh, uh, atrizumab arm. Same with high expression, there is 69 percent uh, benefit uh, overall uh, compared to other group, and they are significant uh, and comparable to other immunotherapy. Same with PDL1 low and the PDL1 negative tumors. So median DOR is a good in arm B compared to the arm A and arm C. Next slide. Same uh, uh, same side they always benefit observed across all PDL1 subgroups like PDL1 high, low, or negative. There is clear benefit uh, uh, in all these uh, three groups. We don't know high patient. They uh, are the most benefit. Obviously, uh, uh, is uh, because of uh, high score. There is good benefit with the uh, atrizumab. Uh, Even PDR1 low and PDR negative uh, group also show good OS benefit. Next slide. Now they uh, compare this trial uh, in the EGFR uh, patient after EGFR TK. Uh, next slide. So, uh, like interdicted population wild tumor, then they take AJ5 mutation or ALK mutation or rearrangement patients treat with AJ5 uh, therapy, and then uh, on the progression they stratified uh, and the randomized patient with a uh, chemotherapy biosimab or atrizumab plus biosimab. Next slide. So, the clinically significant PFS benefit obtained in arm B compared to the arm and arm C. Like the PFS curve separated up to six months uh, in the arm B compared to arm C, so uh, median OAC is around eight point uh, PFS around eight point one months in the arm uh, uh, B, uh, C compared to the uh, around eight point seven months nine point seven months in the arm C and the other ratio is around point five nine. So there is clear benefit of the uh, atrizumab plus chemotherapy plus bisuzumab in EGFR TKI progress patients. Next slide. Similarly, arm B uh, had a uh, uh, OS benefit compared to the arm C. Like uh, uh, we are seeing in this slide, there is twenty-one four uh, four months of OS in arm B compared to the uh, arm C, and the hazard ratio is point six zero. So it's quite significant that TKI patient, uh, is a positive patient after TKI 
we can use uh, option uh, of the atlizumab plus biosum plus chemotherapy next slide the or also there is uh, oral response increase from 42 to 7 uh, 42% to 71% so it's quite significant uh, uh, response also duration of response also good in the uh, atlizumab like sir the 11.1 months in the uh, at least, I'm in a purpose from the BOSG. Next slide. Uh, so, some uh, they are so divided in the liver meds question. Uh, next slide. There is also a clinical meaningful PFS benefit of the RMB uh, versus RMC in patient with liver metastasis at the baseline. Like it's a uh, median is 5.4 months in the chemo plus biosimum compared to 8.2 months in the chemo plus biosimum plus atelizumab arm. And the patient with liver metastasis a negative prognostic uh, factor. Still, it can be okay. So, in conclusion, next slide. Next slide. Next slide. So there is uh, additional biosimab to atlizumab plus chemotherapy provide overall response rate and duration of response in patient with liver metastasis. Uh, next slide. Also, uh, the patients with bulky disease uh, uh, had a good uh, uh, OS benefit with the immunotherapy. Next slide. Like high disease burden is a more than third quartile or more than two million uh, metastasis size. If they have more than two sites of mets, they store a bulky disease. If less than two uh, mets, uh, this called uh, metastasis size is called uh, non bulky disease. Next slide. And in this slide, we said that the arm B is a uh, meaningful and uh, significant OS and BFS benefit compared to the uh, RMC. So in bulky disease or non-bulky disease, the uh, atelizumab plus biosimum plus chemotherapy had significant benefit uh, compared to BFS plus chemotherapy. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, so the septic profile is uh, comparable to the other group. Uh, compared to the other group, the obviously the immune related, mediated, uh, immune mediated side effects more with the immune therapy arm compared to the BSC map. But the overall the septic profile is uh, uh, good in the uh, immune therapy arm. Next slide. So in conclusion, I am five or fifty is a positive study uh, in the first line non squamous NACLC with statistically significant. And clinically meaningful uh, improvement in both uh, co primary input OS and PFS for the uh, immunotherapy arm. Clinical uh, benefit observed in key subgroups of patients with EGFR or uh, genetic alteration, or liver metastasis, or uh, at baseline, or the bulky disease. Atlizumab in combination with chemotherapy plus match biosimab is a well, well, well tolerated and uh, uh, safety profile is uh, consistent with the uh, uh, non safety uh, risk. Additional patient care is beyond periodontal expression may be considered uh, when making uh, chemo immunotherapy treatment decision uh, for non squamous NCLC patients. Next slide. So, it's a phase three uh, randomized trial. The first chemo immunotherapy combination uh, to demonstrate meaningful OS in EGFR positive patients uh, in and patient with liver meds. And the uh, PFS benefit is uh, double uh, around 38% with the immunotherapy arm compared to 20% in Avestin plus Carbo plus uh, Peckley arm. Next slide. So, interrupted population, the uh, at, at Atelizumab arm is a 90.8 months uh, uh, benefit is, uh, in the, uh, compared to 14.9 months in the BOCG arm. EGF mutation is a 29.4 months, is quite significant and only uh, immunotherapy which uh, have some promising role in EGF mutation patients. And liver metastasis is a higher 30.3 months compared to 9.4 months. So higher overall response to atelizumab plus biosimab plus carbaprex biosimab. So thanks, uh, I uh, conclude my slide here. Thank you, Dr. Ashish, for enlightening us about the role of fatazolizumab in first line lung. Can I share my slide? 
yes sir you can share slides sir My slides are visible. Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, thank you for the uh, this talk. So, I will be talking on role of VGF inhibitor in NSCLC, and I will briefly overview the, the role uh, of these drugs in non-small cell lung cancer. So, as we all know that uh, apart from uh, those patients who cannot afford. Uh, immunotherapeutic drugs, we still don't have any option for those patients who doesn't have uh, any actionable mutation. The, there is limited benefit in stage 4 non-small cell lung cancer with only chemotherapy. So, uh, there is uh, the, this VAGF. What is this VAGF? So, tumor and normal cell release a protein called VAGF which stimulates the growth of new blood vessels, a, a process called angiogenesis. And these new vessels feed the growth of the tumor. They also provide a highway for tumor cells to spread to other parts of the body. So it is a uh, VEGF is a key mediator of angiogenesis and it affects survival, proliferation as well as migration through uh, the route of uh, angiogenesis. So studies have shown that the targeting VEGF protein may interfere with the tumor's ability to grow and spread. So right now we uh, have two drugs uh, that are that are being used in uh, lung cancer that is bevacizumab and ramosurumab so these are the indications that i can get uh, for uh, vgf inhibitor first uh, in in first line setting where there is no actionable uh, mutation positive non small cell lung cancer we can combine bevacizumab with pemetrexate and carboplatin or paclitaxel plus carboplatin and in second line non small cell lung cancer uh, we can use ramosurumab along with uh, a docetaxel or uh, right now there is a phase 2 study of ramosurumab plus pembrolizumab in post first line immune checkpoint uh, inhibitor uh, we can use uh, this combination the other indication is first line egfr mutation positive metastatic non small cell lung cancer where we can combine arlotinib plus bevacizumab and arlotinib plus ramosurumab so i will uh, briefly overview what are the uh, uh, what are, what are the studies that are there for all these indications? So this is the proposed treatment algorithm for uh, non-small cell lung cancer with no actionable mutation positive. Those who are with poor PS, we either give single agent or combination chemotherapy or uh, immunotherapeutic drug. Uh, those who are having good performance status and non squamous histology, we can give pemetrixate uh, carboplatin along with bevacizumab plus or minus pembrolizumab if patient is affording. So, uh, uh, in this patient, uh, we can combine uh, bevacizumab. So, coming to bevacizumab, it is uh, uh, humanized to avoid immunogenicity. It is 93% humor. Uh, so, bevacizumab, uh, uh, this is the phase 3 study of bevacizumab where it was uh, compared in a randomized fashion between Pakli Carbo plus Bev versus uh, bevacizumab plus Pakli Carbo. Uh, the dose used were 15 mg per kg. And here they have seen that there was slight improvement in median overall survival from 10.3 to 12.3 months. The hazard ratio of 0.79 and it was found to be statistically significant. The secondary endpoints were also uh, uh, better like PFS and objective response rate was increased in the bevacizumab group with 35% versus 15% and PFS was 6.2 months versus 4.5 months. Coming to the toxicity of bevacizumab in this phase 3 trial, so uh, there was increased risk of severe or fatal hemorrhage, 1.1% versus 4.7%. The pulmonary hemorrhage risk was slightly increased, 0.5 to 23 
and hypertension was uh, more seen in this patient around 7% of the patient uh, the febrile neutropenia and uh, severe proteinuria these were the main side effect although you can see the percentage uh, of the patient having such kind of severe effects was less than uh, around 5% only so uh, the bevacizumab combination uh, regimen was found to improve progression free survival uh, uh, three months versus 4.8 months six month overall survival from 62.4% versus 72% and the crpr rates were also improved the drug discontinuation and all those toxicity were quite comparable uh, now uh, the uh, the second line indication uh, for uh, the another drug that is ramucilumab plus docetaxel is also there in the revel trial they have seen that median progression free survival was 4.5 months in those group who have received ramucilumab uh, along with docetaxel versus just 3 months in those patient who have received single agent docetaxel the median overall survival was also uh, slightly better 10.5 months versus 9.1 months so as you can see in this graph that there, there was slight improvement in uh, uh, overall survival prob probability from 9.1 months versus 10.5 months and there was 43% uh, of the patient survived one year or longer with uh, ramucilumab now this is the recent study published in 2022 here they have compared the standard of care uh, in those patient who who were be in Uh, who was treated previously with immunotherapy and uh, they have uh, uh, either used investigator's choice in one arm docetaxel gemcitabine pemetrix and all uh, combination uh, all uh, cytotoxic chemotherapy or they have combined ramucilumab plus pembrolizumab so they have continued pembrolizumab in those who have previously received immunotherapy and uh, they have seen that overall uh, survival was significantly improved with uh, ramucilumab pembrolizumab versus just cytotoxic chemotherapy it was 14.5 months versus 11.6 months as you can see in the graph that it was uh, it is uh, separating right from the start that uh, the ramucilumab uh, pembrolizumab arm has done better 4.5 14.5 versus 11.6 months the hazard ratio was 0.69 and it was uh, statistically uh, significant the progression free survival was also numerically um uh, comparable 4.5 months versus 5.2 months in all the subgroups as you can see whether it is a uh, uh, mixed non squamous uh, previous uh, uh, io plus chemotherapy combination or a sequential uh, chemotherapy followed by immune checkpoint you know, in all the subgroups uh, it ha it has uh, benefited ramucilumab plus pembrolizumab arm um, was favored uh, in, in this study next uh, the other indication for these drugs comes in those patient who have egfr mutation positive so right now for egfr mutation positive we have uh, various uh, egfr inhibitors uh, where osimertinib which is a third generation is the, uh, right now the preferred drug the other combination that are being explored is allotinib plus bevacizumab and allotinib plus ramucilumab and uh, there are other second generation drugs also so here we will be talking about vegf inhibitors the role of them so uh, first coming to ramucilumab plus erlotinib in the relay trial here they have seen that progression free survival was significantly longer in ramucilumab plus uh, erlotinib 19.4 months versus 12.4 months the stratified hazard ratio was 0.59 so it was significantly better and in those patient who have especially l uh, exon 21 l8858r mutation has uh, greatly benefited and this combination has uh, till date shown to have maximum progression free survival in the l8858r mutation positive patient even uh, better than uh, osimertinib so uh, here you can see the one year pfs rate for 17 uh, 70.4% versus just 46.4% in the erlotinib alone on so it uh, the, this combination has uh, done well in this patient the other vegf combination that was being used was bevacizumab plus erlotinib arm in nej026 uh, study and uh, this uh, trials uh, 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 further uh, uh, follow up uh, study has just came 
and previously it has shown to have a, a similar kind of progression free survival benefit but uh, the recent overall survival uh, data has shown that the addition of bevacizumab to arlotinib has not prolonged the survival in patients with metastatic egfr mutant nscnc but uh, uh, in this uh, study uh, uh, they have seen very long uh, overall survival 46.2 months in the arlotinib arm and 50.7 months in the bevacizumab um, so although uh, in the previous study also although they have got uh, uh, a good progression free survival but still we have to wait for longer os data to use these uh, drugs in a very uh, confirmed fashion so right now uh, again i will summarize these are the indication of egf inhibitors where we can use this drug first line with no actionable mutation positive nsclc with pemetrexate carboplatin plus uh, pembrolizumab plus bevacizumab you can use this drug the uh, other combination that you can use along with the uh, atezo plus bev the second line non small cell lung cancer you can use ramucirumab plus docetaxel or ramucirumab plus pembrolizumab in those who have previously refused uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor and first line eg for mutation positive metastatic nlcls i will prefer more uh, uh, of ramucirumab rather than bevacizumab uh, considering uh, the overall survival data of bevacizumab has not fared well but still um, as uh, the i will uh, comment on this that uh, these drugs are not of uh, found to have that much promising till date and there are some limited uh, kind of indications where i use it i mostly use these drugs in those patient who have significant pleural effusion and i want a definite response rate uh, because patient is symptomatic so uh, as we uh, we have seen in uh, these studies that uh, those patients who have received these drugs have better uh, response rate so in those patient where you, you need a better response rate it is better we use this drug thank you thank you very much thank you dr siddharth for your uh, wonderful presentation regarding role of vegf inhibitors in lung cancer now we move on to the most awaited session of the day it is panel discussion about role of immunotherapy in lung cancer i would like to invite dr ulas batra sir who is the chief of thoracic medical services at rajiv gandhi cancer institute delhi who is going to moderate the session i would like to also invite the panelists dr rajit channa who is consultant medical oncologist from dharamshila narayan delhi dr renu mishra who is assistant professor of uh, department of medical oncology at gitanjali medical college udaipur dr amit kumar who is consultant medical oncologist from patna dr anshul agarwal consultant medical oncologist from kiran hospital surat dr samir shirangwar who is consultant medical oncologist of nci nagpur and dr tarachan gupta who is consultant medical oncologist at bhagwan mahavir cancer institute jaipur dr ulas uh, sir Itesh, I think uh, some of them are still joining. So, meanwhile, if anyone is having question, then we can take that. Uh, else, I think Rajit, uh, Amit, Anshul, I can see them. They have joined. Sure. So we can take any questions. So, uh, just while people are joining. Uh, Rajit or Anshul, uh, will you interchange IO drugs uh, for indication? Means, say for financial reason, uh, ideally, if pembrolizumab is something which is uh, should be given, but because of financial reason, will you shift to nivolumab? Say for example, first line PDL one more than fifty percent, and patient is not able to afford uh, pembro or ATS for whatever it means. Whether you will swap the drugs or not, that is what I wanted to. no so sir in the case of uh, uh, more than 50% sir actually atezolizumab uh, is uh, a bit cheaper option because uh, we are getting uh, one plus three cycles in 3.6 lakhs so near, near about 90000 at the cost uh, just like of nivolumab i, I think uh, cheaper than that than nivolumab what is your yeah so uh, i agree means uh, uh, what i want to ask that whether you will use nivolumab in pdl1 more than 50% if uh, 
just due to logistic reason i understood that atazolizumab well would be cheaper uh, from that perspective but my main question would be whether you will be comfortable switching uh, ios say there are some uh, indications like in second line we want pdl1 more than 1% to use pembrolizumab in first line uh, we don't have data for nivolumab alone uh, metastatic setting so for some reason will you uh, swap the drugs or you will try to go with the drugs which are indicated means which are approved as per indication so we go to uh, as per approved indication because patient is spending so much so the indication should be there i think ullas sir has already joined so i think yes welcome ullas sir good evening yeah hi yes hi sir we are just waiting for you so we have completed all the sessions and just uh, you have joined so it's great uh, welcome sir thank you oh i was told actually we are 20 minutes late so otherwise i could have joined early i'm so sorry now we are on time sir thank you sir okay fantastic uh, so can i um, can you please invite my panelists for me please yeah sure sir so ulas sir will be moderating the session about the role of immunotherapy in lung cancer uh, ulas sir needs no introduction but uh, to uh, for, formally to introduce him he is senior consultant medical oncologist and chief of thoracic services at rajiv gandhi cancer institute delhi i would like to invite the panelists for the discussion dr rajit Uh, Chana, who is a consultant medical oncologist at Dharamshala NH Delhi, Dr. Renu Mishra, who is assistant professor in the Department of Medical Oncology at Gitanjali Medical College and Hospital Udaipur, Dr. Amit Kumar, who is consultant medical oncologist from Medanta Hospital Patna, Dr. Anshul Agarwal, who is consultant medical oncologist from Kiran Hospital Surat, Dr. Samir Shirangwa, consultant medical oncologist from NCI Nagpur. and dr tarachand gupta who is consultant medical oncologist at bhagwan mahavir cancer hospital and research center jaipur uh, sir dr renu is not available uh, due to uh, due to some emergency and dr uh, samir will join in 5 minutes sir you also sure. must have told him it's 15 minutes late no that is <laughs> okay <laughs> fantastic so dr renu is not there so can I, uh, so basically we have rajat we have amit we have dr tarachand and anshul fantastic so um, we will be uh, talking about the panel discussion on role of immunotherapy in lung cancer and my first reactions when i have to moderate a discussion on immunotherapy in lung cancer is like this i mean is this a trick question i mean uh, i mean really i mean even in 2022 are we debating about this uh, my subsequent reactions basically on this i think it's not a believer of uh, it or when it's a believer of how much you know so we all know immunotherapy is here to stay and uh, the only issue is how much is the uh, quantum of benefit basically so role of immunotherapy in lung cancer to me uh, is there is 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 like koi shak so i'll start with dr tarajan dr tarajan do you think there is any shak in role of immunotherapy in lung cancer uh, absolutely no sir the immunotherapy has changed the uh, uh, lung cancer paradigm uh, 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 oriental yes okay. so uh, dr amit Yes, sir. so yes, sir. There is no uh, basically it works very good uh, and it has really changed. So many have the five years of level has really we are now getting in lung cancer and most treated goes to immunotherapy in uh, in rare mutation. So no, no, no shock from two people. Uh, let's go on to Dr. Rajat. Rajat is there. Uh, Rajat is there. I can see him. I I can. Hey, Rajat. Okay, looks like some network issues. Uh, Doctor Anshul. Uh, sir, I don't have any shock, sir. We we have to give three minutes to them. Okay, fantastic. So I think we can close the panel discussion now. I mean, all of us are very very okay that there is no shock as uh, as far as immunotherapy in lung cancer is concerned. So I mean, let's close the session and then take it from there. Let's have a good dinner and sleep. Okay, but still we have a job to do for next twenty minutes. Uh, so i'll again start with the uh, if rajat has joined uh, rajat and dharamshala where do you typically use immunotherapy in lung cancer as new adjuvant adjuvant consolidation first line second line small cell cl lung so a majority of the patients in the last 100 immunotherapy that you have given are in which uh, which which part of the their journey in lung cancer rajat is there 
I think the um, the the uh, administrators can talk to Dr. Rajat because we are not able to hear him. Maybe there is some connection issue with the, the huge rains in Delhi. So maybe that is the issue. Uh, Amit, your call. It's mostly in the second line stage four non-small cell lung cancer, which we are using maximum patients. Maximum patient in stage four non-small cell lung cancer, second line. That, that is option number fifth. Okay. Uh, out of let's say uh, out of hundred percent, eighty percent, ninety percent, seventy percent in second line. Uh, surely, so something around seventy percent in the second line. And the remaining after that. Few patient in the first line also I use. So you, you, why are you ashamed of this? This is not a BMS session, no. If you can't, as a, if you can't, you know, put a, uh, you know, in, in a BMS session, even if you have a lock, you are not supposed to put the key into that. You say we'll break open the lock, but we'll not say keyword in that in the in the BMS session. But in this session, we can say uh, the keynote word, no. Okay, Dr. Tarachan, what is your uh, practice looks like? Uh, sir, uh, as a consolidation after a CTRT, yes. Okay. As a second line stage for non-small cell lung cancer in a driver mutation negative patient, yes. A small cell lung cancer, yes. And for the first line, if the patient is frail with the PDL one is more than fifty percent, then yes. So majority Single. of the patients is in which line, sir? Uh, second line NSCLC, and uh, uh, I rarely find I uh, there is scarcity of the patient on CTRT. But if yes, I I found it, then I will give it, and I have used in and a small cell lung cancer. I am using since the first line. Okay. In the first. So uh, basically, again, by another similar one, seventy percent uh, in second line stage four, uh, and maybe then a CTRT and small cell CA lung first line. Fantastic. Uh, Anshul. So, uh, so same sir. In second line, uh, so maximum number of patients they uh, they can become agree to take the immunotherapy. And uh, why is so, it know, that you know uh, people don't take the chemo uh, the immunotherapy in the first line? Uh, uh, the the administrators, please uh, let me know when Rajat and everybody else join so that you know I can fire the questions them also. Till the time the three of us will uh, interact. So what stops uh, what stops the patients from taking the uh, chemo the immunotherapy in the first line? What happens over there? So sometimes many of the patients uh, they think uh, they think the financial issue and uh, after the uh, progression on the first line of therapy, again they uh, they arrange uh, uh, for the immunotherapy uh, for second line, sir, because so maybe, they don't they don't have so much options left. So them. much option, maybe they think you know chemos will work wonders for us. Uh, maybe we will have not. Answer option. one uh, one more thing that in the lung cancer when we know that there are survivals are very uh, survivals are great. And uh, sometimes we want to uh, have uh, some uh, number of lines alive. So uh, because in the first line, if the patient is less than fifty percent, then the data is along with the chemotherapy. And uh, so I want to spare the uh, chemotherapy lines as we know that the uh, survivals are improving. And uh, year and year we are getting new medicines in the lung cancer also. So that's why I I, I was just uh, no. But my yeah. point over there is everybody said that you know uh, that and it's even in my practice uh, now, uh, not now. Uh, uh, now we are putting more patients in first line non-small cell lung cancer immunotherapy. My question is: Is there a is there a uh, what is the problem? Is the problem lies with our counseling, or does the patient uh, does the problem lies with patient finances? And you know when they are pushed to the wall, it's like you know you are five or six down. Then you will go and slog. In the initial one and two, you want to play safe. Is that the thing, uh, Dr. Amit? Uh, what is your take on that? Yes, yeah, surely finances is the first concern, and the second is counseling also. So in the first line, we are somehow confident with the chemotherapy too, rather than just pushing for immunotherapy. In second line, since no option is left, we ask the patient to go for immunotherapy. So the counseling part surely varies uh, during the first and second line. But surely, if the finances the patient is completely financially compatible, we go for the first line with immunotherapy. Okay, so they, that is absolutely what I agree with Dr. Amit. You know, I always ask my coach, uh, my patient, our first question. I mean, this is what I have now reformed my uh, way of uh, counseling them. I said, "Ki aap abhi immuno nahi le sakte ho, ki kabhi nahi le sakte ho." So then, if they say, "Ki ham kabhi le sakte hain," then I say, "You please take it right now." In the first line, agar ap kabhi nahi le sakte ho, then we will think over that because there is a hell lot of a difference in giving immunotherapy in second line versus giving immuno chemo combination in first line. I mean, you know the survival rates, the response rates of PDL one more than fifty percent second line 
at 25 percent. But if PDL one first line comes, you have a response rate of 45 to 60 percent. If you give pembrolizumab plus chemotherapy, a keynote 18, 189, and a keynote 42 or 24, you have a five year survival of 32 percent. In second line, you have a survival of only 16 percent. So I mean, now my counseling has changed. So what was happening was that initially we were doing a, a, a pilot project in which we were determining liquid biopsy as a mechanism. So initially in 2018, 2019, I had a lot of patients on second line. We had some 17, 18 patients in second line. Then came 2020 and the pembrolism map, uh, the PAP was available. And now I am struggling to get patients on map because now my counseling has changed and I always tell the patient that, you know, take it in the first line because the magnitude of benefit is much more higher. Uh, having said that, uh, one huge uh, concern which comes over there is uh, in the beginning of the uh, your journey and your interaction with the patient, if you tell them uh, 40 lakh rupees in one uh, uh, one uh, in one year and uh, two years, 80 lakh rupees, half the patients will not take chemotherapy from you. They'll say we'll go to some other doctor who will give only chemotherapy. So that's also something which actually happens. And I am I'm not, a, you know, I mean, I also work in a private sector. So I am I'm used to, you know, uh, you tell patient chemo immuno and the next day patient is somewhere else and taking chemotherapy over there. But sir, that's why, sir, that's why I usually counsel patient for the cash paying patient in the second line. But in the first line, I uh, use in the reimbursement category or the patient ask uh, proactively that can I take the chemo immunotherapy also. Yeah, Dr. Tarajan, you're right. But the point is uh, the science, I mean the commerce, I am telling you, I have lost patients. But over the period of time, I have seen now those people come back again to me and say, and they, you know, after taking second, third opinions, you know, doctor, what you said was right. So I'll again tell you an anecdote, you know, uh, when I started doing lung and again, I'm in a corporate sector. Uh, so we used to give four cycles of chemotherapy and then we used to give oral TKIs because everybody knows. Then we in six months into my own uh, uh, unit and I realized it is not really going to make a difference. We stopped giving chemotherapy as a first line to the patient. And trust me, the number of pools of patients have actually gone more. Because, you know, people uh, people are smart. I'm telling you, people are smart. There are so many patient advocacy groups. There are so many WhatsApp groups. There are so many Google groups. There are so many so many second opinion groups. If you tell them this, no. I mean, uh, ultimately, they will say, ha, doctor, that American doctor, my chacha ki, mommy ki, tai ki, beti wahan beti hai, usne ye bola jo aapne bola tha. So science-wise, I think we should give immunotherapy in the first time. That is what I would say. But I totally agree with you that it is difficult to convince patient, uh, you know, 80 lakhs of rupees uh, for two years. And then also you're not giving him any response. It's, it's, it's a difficult proposition to take. But let's go ahead. Uh, has anybody else joined? Uh, uh, Rajit is there or somebody else is there now? Uh, sir, I think uh, Rajit is there, but he's not able to... Some network issue is there and he's not able to connect. And uh, Renu has not joined. Okay, fair enough. And uh, Dr. Samir was supposed to join. Samir has also not joined. No? Samir has not. So the three of us will be there. And since you are the, uh, since then you'll have to fill up for them, Rishab. Then sure, you, 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 sure, you, you, uh, you put up on your my, uh, the camera and we will talk to you now. Okay. So uh, Rishab, your choice of immunotherapy agent in lung cancer, most of the time, 100 times out of this thing, do you give a single agent in combination with chemo? Uh, IO IO combination or a IO IO chemo combination? Sir, I have not given 100 IO yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> in most. <laughs> okay, we have just given 100. That's okay. <laughs> okay. Most of the time, uh, I do give uh, chemo plus IO okay. uh, in first line. Uh, PDL1, more than 50% patient not symptomatic. Uh, is something. To, we will come to that later on. We, I have some yes. slides for that also. Don't worry. Sure, sir. Sure. Sir. So, you basically give IO plus chemo. Okay. Yes. Yes. And uh, Amit? Uh, mostly single agent in the second line. If it is the first line, then IO plus chemo. Okay. Otherwise, let's let's put a hand on our heart and then say how many people have given immunotherapy plus chemotherapy in second line non small cell lung cancer. Anshul, you're smiling, at least on the on the on the DP that you have on this. No, sir. Uh, so no, I'm not given combination in second line. Okay, you have not given IO and chemo in the uh, uh, IO chemo combination in second line. Yes, sir. Small, small paclitic cell along with nivolumab just to have some response. No, sir. <laughs> okay. In head and neck, sir, I, I have tried. No, no, no. We are talking about lung cancer. Not in head and neck, we'll talk later. Okay. Okay, Dr. Tarachan. Uh, no, sir. In second line, I have not used the, any uh, 
combination. But yes, in uh, immunotherapy alone, I am giving. Okay, fair enough, uh, Doctor uh, Amit. In small cell lung cancer, sir, always I have used the combination in second line. That is with either enotecan or in second line. Yes, sir. Okay, that's that's interesting. But uh, there is no approval for that, no. Uh, that's true, but uh, some of my all patients are responding. Uh, oh, wow. Patients are gone, and it is so they are with the combination, and they all be responded good. Okay. Although I do uh, totally agree, you know, uh, I I always I to I spoke to the BMS guys also. See, we give second line chemotherapy in uh, uh, in lot of patients. So maybe it was the trial was against nivolumab versus docetaxel, the the checkmate seventeen and fifty seven. There could have been an arm in which we can compare nivolumab plus a low dose, uh, you know, a metronomic chemotherapy or a weekly packly versus only nivolumab. you know because there are certain patients who do not respond in the second line so to me let's say you know somebody has taken three cycles of pemcap has a massive disease in the uh, let's say lung and liver and bones i am 100% sure i mean okay i am 80% sure that guy is not really going to relax so there could have been a trial but as far as the current ethics are concerned you guys are absolutely right second line you should always give nivolumab because if something happens to the patient you will have nothing to defend so second line uh, non small cell lung cancer is uh, basically nivolumab which is basically going to be given first line i'll come to that now okay what about iui yeah it's a, sir it's not a more than 25% response in second line and you are right i think we should try some chemotherapy and we can try off the trial also yeah, as a, as a tms guy tried in hnac already yes. and we are so, and because the chemotherapy pushes the patient to get the response and meanwhile immunotherapy can take right. the take over the scenario but the point there is dr daraj and there is that you know tms guys can do because tms guys in tms can do uh, <laughs> yes. tms guys outside tms cannot do that's the yes sir i completely agree sir because otherwise no that uh, patient will go uh, to the tms in guys inside the tms to complain about tms guys outside the tms <laughs> yes sir <laughs> it will become an issue over there yes sir okay. completely what about uh, the chemo light checkmate night nele or a checkmate 227 uh rishab what is your take on that sir uh, not used not you uh, i am uh, so uh, only two cycles of chemotherapy is something which excites uh, but the cost of ipilimumab is something which is not making it feasible okay so the cost of ipilimumab is something which is not very uh, the same okay fair enough uh, uh, amit this is not used till date but still the data and the path cr rate is really in this group of patients are very good okay so we are surely going to use okay anshul so not used not used the other column reason for that anshul not used So I have a combination because of that yardol is very 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 costly. Sir. Very very costly, and we are not even sure about the side effects. Doctor Tarajan, ah, uh, you are muted, Doctor Tarajan. The TMH guys inside the TMH have muted you. Sorry, ah, <laughs> no, ah, no, uh, no I O I O combination has been used till now in any cancer. Okay, it's I O I O. I think uh, I mean I have also asked been asked this question multiple number of times and I see that I have not used a IO IO or a chemo light combination because there is no need. I mean you use a combination if it is better than chemo immuno or a chemo combination. If it has never been used and I have honestly you know all these talks about patient not willing for chemo, I have hardly seen a patient who is willing for two cycles of chemotherapy but not willing for four cycles of chemotherapy. I mean what kind of stupid logic is that I don't understand and I hope the BMS guys are not listening to this. Anyway. Uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, your choice of biomarkers in the selection of immunotherapy. So uh, let's say you have a stage four lung cancer, uh, non-small cell lung cancer, adenocarcinoma. Uh, all the biomarkers, NGS foundation medicine is done negative. Will you now do a PDL one, TMB, MSI, NGS, or liquid biopsy? I mean, or what all will you do? I'll start with Dr. Amit. Like if NGS from foundation one is negative, then only PDL one and. I just have yeah. just one second. Amit, Amit, I just have got a message from one of the BMS guys who is listening to this. <laughs> you know, you should try IO IO. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> See, I'm I'm making more enemies now. <laughs> the Merck people have not, MSC people have not messaged me, <coughs> but the BMS guys are messaging me. You know that we should use IO IO. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. So sir, if the NGS no foundation one is negative in that case, so really you might might be go for a PDL one testing and, and only. 
what will pdl1 change i mean i am a nice note like today so we just i mean a fun discussion <laughs> Uh, I don't think so. Sir. It's only with a method of testing. That is by ISC. We are now testing. Okay, so in the EB test, you might just find out. Fair enough. But if the yeah. PDL one is negative, will you not use immunotherapy? No, still I will use immunotherapy. Will use. If it is fifty percent, the only use of PDL one I think is if you want to use a PDL one immunotherapy alone, or uh, in more than fifty percent, sixty percent. And the second most important use of PDL one to me, and what I usually tell my patients in. Uh, Is how much do I push them for immunotherapy? So you know, if you have, if you have a cash patient, as I think Anshul or Dara Chand said, if I have a cash patient and PDL one more than seventy percent or fifty percent, I'll tell them, dude, there is a high chance that you will respond to immunotherapy. The PDL one less than one uh, percent, my my uh, my voice only goes a bit low. That's the only thing. Although I have seen responses both in second line and we have published data of nivolumab. In which PDL one negative people have responded, and we have the data of first line uh, uh, immunotherapy in which the uh, you know uh, PDL one patients uh, who are negative also have responded to Pembro Pemca. So I think PDL one is a good marker, but it's only it's an imperfect biomarker. Uh, it will only tell you it will make your conviction strong. That's the only thing which I think. So Dr. Tara Chan, TMB. Uh, sir, no, sir. Uh, I am using only the PDL one till now. If the NGS is negative for the driver mutation, uh, as uh, you rightly said, that it helps in the counselling also, and it gives the confidence to me also that yes. I can use uh, this in a first line. If it is at least more than one percent, if it is not, then I will use in second line and uh, in immunotherapy, not in first line. Fantastic, Anshul. So. Uh... Actually, sir, I will go ahead with PDL one and TMB both testing, sir, because uh, uh, if we, if we see that the last abstract in as per two thousand twenty two, so PDL one if if high but TMB if if low, so that patients they don't uh, uh, make well with the immunotherapy. So, so there are some so population which in which PDL one should be and high and TMB high they uh, make well with immunotherapy. So I I, I make doubly sure, sir. Okay. So TMB, uh, you know, my take on TMB usually is a first of all, uh, not many laboratories do it. A, you really have to send to foundation medicine. Uh, you don't know what is the cut off over there. There's a different cut off in liquid. There's a different cut off in uh, tissue. And the Checkmate two two seven trial only had shown that TMB was not predictive of uh, any immunotherapy response in uh, whether the TMB was high or low. So yes, if TMB is high, it might just push me towards. Uh, a uh, immunotherapy but if tmb is low i will not deny the patient immunotherapy based on that so that is my take on uh, tmb having said that it's a good marker uh, the unusual responses in immunotherapy was one of this thing and i i told uh, dr parik also at that time uh, the plural of a single case report is not series is not randomized controlled trial uh, so and you know when we were discussing i always said that you know uh, we should not go back with a message that we can try immunotherapy in everyone Uh, but yes, TMB is a good foundation medicine. Does give the TMB report uh, along with that. MSI people are testing for MSI. Ah, uh, uh, sir, started in some other cancers uh, along with PDL one, but still reports are awaiting. Okay, and yes. Rishab, sir, uh, it gets covered in some NGS panels. So uh, I have not done it specifically, but when I get uh, in some NGS panel, I have not sent specifically for MSI as of now. Okay, so my take on MSI is uh, a basically it is positive only in one to one point five percent of uh, uh, lung cancers. A uh, very very uh, specific matter. The tissue becomes an issue along with that because you have to do NGS, you have to PDL one. Uh, we have not really been doing MSI over there. NGS. Will you all do an NGS before you put the patient onto immunotherapy or NGS is a upper niche ka thing. So is NGS a must before starting a patient on immunotherapy in first line? Yes, sir. So will you not? I mean, so let us say the EGFR report is uh, uh, negative, ALK report is negative, ROS report is negative. Your patient who has got a PDL one of thirty percent, will you give chemo immunotherapy or will you wait for the NGS? Yes. Let me go to Amit. Surely wait for the NGS. Asymptomatic, go for the MBS. Patient party is Delhi walas. <laughs> on your on your messages, doctor, delay to nahi ho jayega. Mere father ka ye to nahi ho jayega. You know, typical Delhi walas who will WhatsApp you left, right, and center. 
might be then only chemotherapy but not immunotherapy before the ngs report only chemotherapy for delhi walas okay <laughs> rishab uh sir if egfr al cross is available uh, i would not uh, hesitate to start uh, because we have some markers where uh, io will work uh, like keras mira uh, also so i don't know whether met and red are something which uh, uh io so will work or not work i'll huh? give an example you have given one cycle of pembro pem carbo and the ngs report comes as beraf mutant now what will you do second line so sir, i will continue some pem- is also joined sir oh, oh. so uh, i will continue io in first line and on progression i will give beraf okay because so, uh, the data about dabraf and eben trematinib is 10.8 months and uh, first line as well as the second line mind it but the response rates to io and chemo are 33% uh, or 40% in immuno chemo combination and they are 65% with dabrafenib trametinib so your patient may not be even able to take uh, dabrafenib trametinib in second line uh, i think there is no right answer then you know we have had this conversation multiple times even in the keynote 189 in all the trials ngs was not a must uh, but you know then you talk to your patient about whether they want an oral tablet so i have had this conversation with many people and i do what amit does i give only one cycle of chemotherapy just to avoid all this convo because we do ngs for everyone now so if egf or alk is negative i put them on to one line one single cycle of chemotherapy by the time second cycle comes we have the ngs report before you start the patient on to uh, pembrolizumab i normally have the ngs report available and then we can take it from there so that is what i typically do Uh, having said that there is no harm in giving keras uh, if somebody got keras inhibitor 12 uh, keras 12c uh, in beraf in fact we are going to have a clinical trial of second line keras 12c in which it is mandated that patient should have chemo immuno in the first time so people with keras they are they are wanting to have uh, you know uh, chemo immuno in the first time so uh, absolutely right but that's what i do is i wait for the ngs before i put the patients on to uh, you know this sir uh, as like egfr and alk we have uh, absolute uh, tki first to avoid uh, io are there other mutations like red met or anything we are aware of so the point here is yaar there is no absolute this thing but the point again which comes over there is an oral tablet you don't have to come you have to spare chemotherapy patients and you know uh, 30% people will always drop so what happens i was just telling you in 2014 uh, when i started my own uh, practice in lung Uh, we were giving chemotherapy to everyone then i realized in 6 months time that 20% of people were not taking dkis a because they went to some other doctor b because they went to ayurvedic homeopathy c because they developed uh, you know uh, some brain meds i felt very bad you know it's a simple oral tablets so i felt that i and it's a, it's a belief that anybody with oncogene erected lung cancer should get a tki first Uh, except for maybe keras and uh, beraf who uh, which are more common in smokers and stuff like that and uh, you know it's an oral pill so to me i am biased towards an oral pill uh, and the cost also comes into picture at that time so that's what i would do okay so i think we have made up our choice and we will want to Last, do sir, sir, one one point for my side dr samir yes. yeah yeah hi sorry i was actually uh, had been no, no. joining so no worry so, uh, you, sir, you are giving chemotherapy sir, You are giving chemo that is based, so you will ask questions. Yeah, sir. On, on, only, answer. only. <laughs> no, no, sir. So I am, I am actually absolutely agreeing with you. That I will just start with only chemotherapy, no combination, and just decide before second cycle for further, uh, means uh, decision yeah. uh, on the basis of NGS. So, sir, uh, what Rishab was saying that other than EGFR and other whether we should give, we can give immunotherapy chemo combination for other driver mutation. So, in general perception, sir, the patient is driver mutation positive. they are less immunogenic they are less likely to respond to immunotherapy yes so yes. for always the driver mutation positive where oral tumor mutation burden is going to be the low rather than the driver mutation negative in such cases always prefer targeted therapy through that in the first line this next line you can always give immunotherapy if there is no other option and the second point always is you know uh, immunotherapy has a long half life so if you look at because you know again uh, we have had a patient on sulpercatinib who developed pneumonitis and if okay. you have given immunotherapy before you know so what happened again i'll tell you my personal experience i have lost people uh, we gave one patient a gefitinib a fatinib uh, then uh, and then osimertinib uh, no ha huh, and a fatinib 
and then uh, abcp two cycles of abcp patient in nurse one got a liquid biopsy or tissue biopsy then again t790 them came positive and we gave osimertinib that patient had a pneumonitis way back in 2017 or 2018 we didn't know i didn't know that you are not supposed to give uh, you know atezo and uh, bev and uh, osimertinib can cause pneumonitis also once the patient had pneumonitis we all went back there are smart people who read that we should not have given so i told them at that time what were you doing sleeping before when we gave <laughs> so you know if one patient of that develops a pneumonitis you won't really feel good about it so that's my take you know i mean uh, let's reserve our immunotherapies and you know the point is uh, the more you reserve immunotherapies for the right patient the more your results become better the more your uh, you know your conviction towards immunotherapy becomes better see when we all side immunotherapy in second line uh you know uh, you ask everyone in the in, in in the same panel 3 years back they'll say sir kaam nahi karti hai panch logon ko diya nahi kaam karti hai i said boss aapka patient selection theek nahi hai na aap fourth line of chemotherapy ke baad mein immunotherapy doge to wo kaam nahi karegi if you have to give immunotherapy give it as early as possible and in the right patient again we did a retrospective analysis of our patients of nivolumab see our nivolumab data and this not just to placate the bms guys who are listening our nivolumab data is absolutely fantastic we have got now people who have got you know uh, a three year survival of some 16 or 20 percent in the real life scenario but that was when we selected our patients very very well so to me uh, you know you should select your patients very very well it does not make it so i i would totally agree with what samir said driver mutation positive my bias is towards oral tkis because a they are more effective B, if you give immunotherapy, you can always have more chance of pneumonitis along with drugs, and you lose a patient over there, you will not like it. So let's come to case scenario one, and I think I have only five more minutes. Your fifty-five-year-old female, a non-smoker, stage four EGFR alpha cross negative, PDL one sixty-five percent. Uh, so I'll go to Samir only. Samir, EGFR alpha cross negative, PDL one sixty-five percent. PET scan is showing lung with effusion with bony meds. MRI brain normal. What would you do? So patient is symptomatic. I wrote, ah, uh, मतलब PS one. So if the patient is symptomatic, I would again try for combo also uh, here also. Even if the PDL will be sixty five percent. You will give? Yeah, even if sixty five more than fifty percent, if the patient is symptomatic, disease burden is heavy. So in such in such cases, sir, even. Pseudo progression or hyper progression early. Uh, uh, you will early give cycles of immunotherapy will, plus immuno plus chemotherapy. Fantastic. Chemo plus immuno combination. Yeah. Key note one eight nine. Fantastic. Yeah. Amit? Yeah. If the patient is complete, yeah, miss like slightly asymptomatic, miss slightly symptomatic, or patient disease burden is not that high. In such cases, only only pembro single agent. Fantastic. Okay, Amit. Uh, surely go for NGS and uh, it's one cycle of chemotherapy. Amit, and... Amit realized it was a trick question. <laughs> 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 so this was a trick question, you know. Yes, I mean it should be driver mutation negative. Or that that is that is what the. <laughs> so it was a trick question, <laughs> Samir. You just gave chemotherapy, so that is why you didn't have the time to you know listen to this the discussion prior to that. Okay, let me go to the next one. So we will do an NGS and then go ahead with that. So I will like to ask uh, Dr. Anshul now. Anshul, what will you not give out of all these things? So, oh, uh, so in this patient, uh, NGS is negative now. Okay, I mean there is no action ever mutation. Um, bro, what is it? So single agent nivolumab. Single agent nivolumab we will not give. नीचे भी आ जा भी नीचे और भी है पढ़ले पढ़ले. We be chemo combo. It's not only one of this. No, no, multiple multiple negatives can be there. So single agent nivolumab you will not give. Are you chemo nivolumab? You can have a tissue. The last two. Iyo chemo, nivolumab, pemetrexid, carboplatin, and I have no, seen prescriptions. I have seen prescriptions in the in which people have given nivo, pem, carb. No, sir, uh, I will not. Give. There is no. I mean, again, I mean, nothing against the BMS people. They are. No, I am not going to get a uh, invite from them for next time. Uh, but you know, so a uh, single agent nivolumab, single agent nivo and pem carb combination, and I would actually stick my neck out and say that atezo pem carb also is something which I will not give. In this subgroup of patient, because the data for atezo pem carb was actually negative, there was no benefit of atezo pem carb versus atezo uh, versus only pem carb. Uh, what we can give is single agent pembro, single agent atezo, 
a nevo ep combination a cm9la and a pembrolizumab cup these are absolutely right uh, what we will not give is single agent nevo and the last two combination so uh, amit how will you decide which one to give out of the remaining five Uh, it's only basically the patient symptomatic status. If it is completely uh, symptomatic patient, need an early response, go with a chemo plus uh, IO combination. Else, only with a single agent IO. Okay, uh, Anshul. So sir, uh, uh, sir, right, sir. If patient is not so symptomatic, then I will go ahead with only with the uh, only atezo. Atezo, sir, I I will uh, go ahead with atezo. So either a single agent atezo or a single, single agent atezo. Uh, this thing, Samir. So you said you said you will give go ahead. You said the cinematic. One thing I will try to uh, tell you over here, actually, which is very very important, which is uh, something which I have just started doing in my clinical practice, is the patient's smoking status. I mean, so look at this. The patient is a never smoker. In this, there was a ESMO virtual plenary, and what they basically found out was that it was not the disease burden actually. It was not the liver meds positive, negative, or the symptomatic burden. in the real world scenario io was equal to io plus chemo the only thing which didn't make a difference was history of smoking if you have a non smoker patient please go ahead and give them a immunotherapy chemotherapy maybe uh maybe because ngs was not done for all these patients it was a real world study but this basically brings me what samir told was very right was you know that oncogene driver driven lung cancer has a lower remission burden has a lower tumor immunogenic immunogenicity so probably a single agent immunotherapy will not act that much uh, that much in the uh, in a never smoker but in our case we have done our uh, ngs but again this is something which i have started doing in my practice you look at this over here no stop smoking is very far uh, which uh, basically favors the uh, chemo immuno combo so be very very of using immunotherapy alone in a patient who is a, a never smoker uh this was again the checkmate efficacy in patients with pdl1 more than this but again when you added ipilimumab that is a checkmate 2 to 7 when you made it keynote 598 when you gave a uh, pembro plus ipilimumab uh, the graphs were by and large together so there is no role of io io combination in uh, pdl1 more than uh, uh, pdl1 more than uh, 50% and this is what the bms guys would be saying ये हो क्या रहा यार हमारे साथ में आई डोंट नो व्हाई इज इफ आई एम नॉट रियली वर्किंग ओके हाउ लॉन्ग विल यू गिव 2 इयर्स ऑफ पेम्ब्रोलिज्मैब आर ओवर व्हाट हैपेंस देन रिशब टेल मी हाउ मच टाइम डू वी हैव आई थिंक वी कैन स्टॉप नाउ इन आफ्टर दिस क्वेश्चन श्योर सर ओके सो व्हाट हैपेंस आफ्टर 2 इयर्स सो विल यू स्टॉप इम्यूनोथेरेपी एट 2 इयर्स और व्हाट हैपेंस आई थिंक आई आस्क रिशब ओनली सर इट्स अ डिफिकल्ट क्वेश्चन मुझे पहुंचे नहीं हम लोग वहां पे पहुंचे ही नहीं है सर सो आई एड वन एम एस आई हाई पेशेंट कॉल ब्लेडर हु कम्प्लीटेड नाउ पेशेंट इज ऑल्सो एप्रीहेंसिव ऑफ स्टॉपिंग एंड इवन आई एम एप्रीहेंसिव ऑफ स्टॉपिंग बट वी हैव स्टॉप्ड एंड शी इज डूइंग वेल एट सिक्स इयर्स आई हैव नॉट फेस सिमिलर सिचुएशन इन लंग एज ऑफ नाउ बट दैट इज अ डिफिकल्ट क्वेश्चन इवन पेशेंट्स आर अफ्रेड टू स्टॉप सो व्हाट आई फील इज दिस पेशेंट इज इन सीआर फॉर लॉन्ग पीरियड ऑफ टाइम से last 10 months of 2 years or 1 year of 2 years then maybe we can stop and if patient is co- continuously responding then maybe we can continue and increase the duration or something like that okay i'm uh, not sure means in practical situation. i will i will tell you some data anshul uh so there is some data that okay, if we can stop we can restart in a case of progression again the pemberism correct, so i correct, will stop correct. two years uh samir i have just stopped for one of my patient of ca colon msi high six month back after 2 years of pembrolizumab and he is doing well so i think uh, sir something somewhere we have to think of stopping the drug because Kabeen they may do well even continue. after after discontinuation okay dr tarajan i so, i am sorry yaar you went off my for the main screen i am so sorry i forgot you in the meantime so sir uh, if the patient is willing to stop at 2 years then i will stop the otherwise patient? i don't have courage to stop and i will go if or other the panel reimbursement category is asking why are you giving so costly medicine continuously then i also can take this and one more thing sir uh, i think if the organizers have no issue then you can continue sir there is no last question because we are this is giving insight to us okay <laughs> that is so true okay uh, that is a after thought from the arish of you know so i will take for five more minutes and then we'll go ahead okay amit what would you do so basically follow the scans of the patient if the patient is Com- complete uh, response is there or a response is static 
for three to three to four scans. In that case, I will stop. Otherwise, I will surely going to continue the therapy. Basically, I have continued oh. nibolumab for five years in one patient who is still going good. So there are two uh, issues in that, Amit. In Keno twenty four and Keno one eight nine, there is a specified duration of two years for nibolumab. So in checkmate trials in second line, you can give nivolumab till progression. But in keynote zero one zero, that is the second line of of pembrolizumab, you are supposed to give it only for two years. That is one. So you can actually stop after two years very very nicely as per the protocol. So what happened out of this forty two patients, I guess, who were there, yeah, these patients which were there, what happened was one third of the patients will recur. Out of those one third patient, if you respond, if you give rechallenge them with pembrolizumab once again, again one third will basically respond to that. So by and large, out of ten, only one or two people are the ones who will not respond. So I think it is reasonable to stop. And what Rishabh and Dr. Tarachan and everybody Anshul I think said, keep on doing their scans. And I think you can safely stop at least pembrolizumab at two years there. But tell the patient that the disease may recur. That is one. Now, what happens in nivolumab is we have had eleven patients who stopped after one year or two years, and uh, you know because of somebody had money issues, somebody had that uh, you know they could not take uh, somebody took for four years and then could not take. Out of eleven patients, four have recurred. After uh, some have recurred after one year, some have recurred after two years, and out of them, everybody has responded right now. We have rechallenged them with immunotherapy, chemotherapy. So I think you know there is also a concept of memory T cells uh, uh, in this. You know, so the uh, the immunity with uh, immunotherapy is long lasting, and we can safely rechallenge them. Think till now things are okay, but then one patient will come who will not respond. If he comes tomorrow, my my approach might change in the next panel discussion. So I will see what happens there. But right now I am stopping at two years. It's you know it's difficult to continue all these medicines for uh, uh, you know more time. Second, uh, one. sir, Samir here. Yes, sir, sir, again, we need a biomarker here to identify patient who are going to respond, uh, continue to respond up even after stopping. So we have done so any, any correlation with PDL one status, sir? No, no, like, no, 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 nothing, nothing. PDL one molecular marker, we can have something like that. Any idea? So Means we have been, a clue. So we have been doing liquid biopsies, and BMS was very uh, uh, courteous enough to give us a grant of a huge amount. We have been doing liquid biopsies at baseline, at uh, uh, two cycles, at four cycles, at eight cycles, and at twenty cycles, uh, to all our patients. Liquid biopsy, we have been trying to monitor the you know mutation, and if it comes down to zero, that is the tool which may come. But the results are not yet out on that. And again, sir, CTC can CTC help in that? CTC again, you know, uh, it, it didn't really work very well in breast. So you know, you, here it is more of a attacking that mutation which was there in the in the uh, in the upfront one. The problem there is that you have to start from the beginning. If you don't start from the beginning, then at at twentieth cycle you don't know what was the status before. So again, right now you have no biomarker to tell whether the patient will respond or not respond to uh, any immunotherapy drug. It's a it's a gut feel and what Rishabh and Samir and Tarachan everybody said, Anshul said, you know, look at the patient keeps on going response. The volume of disease is lesser. What we have also been doing right now is we have been giving radiotherapy to the residual sites. Uh, so you know I am a staunch opponent of uh, anything other than systemic therapy, uh, surgery, radiation, and everything. But more and more we are discussing in tumor board these cases. Uh, what we have now realized is that if there is a if there is a small lung mass which is remaining, it's worth giving radiotherapy to that. It might just increase only PFS. But then you know the treatment of uh, immunotherapy will be great. So I have been doing that also quite a lot more often, and we do discuss these patients in tumor board. Give RT to that one residual site. Maybe the patient will uh, keep on responding, and maybe we will not need any systemic chemotherapy or something for a long time. So, sir, sir, you so do that have... radiotherapy uh, after TKI also, if there is a very good response. Yes, we have been trying to give that also. It will increase the BFS. I'll I'll just share with you an example. I had an ALK positive guy on electinib. Uh, he had a C6 lesion. A lung lesion and uh, alk positive, so we gave electinib, multiple nodules in the same site, and he went to MD Anderson. After four cycles, he had a PET scan uh, response. I got a second consult for that guy. That the guy over there says the C6 lesion has become okay now. At four months, I'll do a lobectomy for that guy, and this C6 will irradiate. I said it's just been four months, so I told them I will do it, but I will not do it right now. I will do it at 12 months or 14 months uh, of uh, electinib so that the patient is responding, 
and then we will give rt to that particular thing to to you know consolidate so in in drugs in in disease such as alk you know when your response rates are high 80% and uh, you know your your life is 7 years it is worth adding those what i don't like and i hope there are no radiation oncologists is you know giving unnecessary radiotherapy when your liver disease over here and somebody is not responding so i think i do base my decision on the biology of the disease not on the anatomy of the disease if your biology of the disease is good you can actually make cancer a chronic disease and lung cancer definitely alk hai iu responding hai we can definitely increase the pfs on treatment somebody with an oligo progression oligo persister we can change the thing over there that's what i usually do so uh, actually it's right sir i i had a patient of melanoma responding to nivolumab map had oligo progressive disease in the pelvis i radiated and patient is doing well since last one and a half year so the more and more you know this is what i i was speaking with tony mock um, i think two years back when he had come to our conference once and he said you know the more and more we i just told him you know you are going to drive the surgeons out of uh, uh, lung cancer he said no the more and more these uh, therapies have a good survival no the more and more surgeons and radiation oncologists will come into the play so now i see more of my rt my ir guys doing uh, microwave ablations rt guys giving srs i have forgotten the last time we had given a wbrt to an alk positive guy uh, the neurosurgeons uh, everybody is coming in a huge way and for that tumor board is very very important it's a fascinating discussion that we have in our tumor boards actually sometimes bishop you you wanted to say something uh, so i just wanted to know the right time to do rt is oligo progression or when you got the nadid response the maximum response that nobody knows <laughs> so it's it, it's it's a judgment call and then again it's always you know uh, let's say the patient is doing very very good at that time you say yaar yeah, what are we going to irradiate uh, so it also depends on where the lesion is let's say it's a peripheral lesion nothing is really going to happen you can just give rt over there right now we are not doing it at the time of nadir let's let's not go with that uh, this thing right now i am doing it for oligo progression we are doing a trial in which we are doing a nadir so we don't know whether the data will come or not but right now oligo progression oligo persisters we are doing a, a localized uh, treatment over there uh the second one i think we'll just quickly go to that uh, pdl1 35% now what would you do same patient pdl1 35% uh tarachand dr tarachand what since you Sir, are so, you now are, in this option single agent pembro out okay and uh, rest the pembro iu iu or pembro chemo or if the patient is not affording only chemo yeah so fair enough i mean in these uh you know single agent pembro atizo nivo all single agent out nivo ep cm nine la pembro pem so four five six options remain the last two options obviously i were never in a part of uh, uh, my this thing and this is what was the pdl1 1 to 49% basically showed and checkmate nine la also is a very good option uh, but i think keynote 189 there is nothing to beat uh, keynote 189 in this last one and then we'll stop a believer of immunotherapy in pdl1 less than 1 or not i'll go to amit yes sir uh, before this panel and after this panel don't don't <laughs> just because i have said don't say that no i will still give chemo plus immuno you will give chemo plus immuno okay uh, uh, tanan dr tanachan uh, no sir i will go with chemo combination only you will go for chemo plus immuno you will no no, no, no sir only chemo only chemo only chemo no chemo immuno dr anshu no chemo immuno रिस्पॉन्सेंट so the higher you have pdl1 the higher response will come nobody has really done 0 to 10 10 to 20 20 to 30 it's almost like er 30 40 and then er 70 80 so i think data have... data is for less than one but we don't know whether negatives are responding so that is because the pharmaceutical people are smart no they don't want to if the 10% data is only hardly positive you will not uh, give no <laughs> Yeah right. <laughs> so so better you have to care for twenty to thirty, thirty to forty. Yeah. So the more breakup you have, the more, right. the more. So you will give less. So but I think the bottom line is uh, less than one and more than one. More than one will respond definitely better. 
but it's not that uh, less than one will not really uh, respond to it. And just in case you thought your job sucked, just think of the job that this guy is doing. Again, I will show you over here, Keynote 189, CM227 are by and large, uh, you know, the HR values are 0 0.59, 0 0.62, 0 0.61. So it's not that they don't work. Here is where Checkmate 9LA also comes into the uh, play. Period one less than one person, squamous, non-smoker, female. With brain meds is one patient in which Checkmate 9LA will do very, very well. But these people will again do better than chemotherapy. No. And again, uh, I know, uh, you know, so they may not derive as much as great benefit, but the, there will be some benefit. So again, if it's a, as, you know, uh, Tara Chand and everybody said, if you have a cash paying patient, my, my volume goes down. But I don't tell patient it will not work. I tell them, Hoga, I just to tone their expectations down. But uh, immunotherapy, I believe, you know, because there's a lot of tumor heterogeneity and PDL was not a perfect biomarker. I will still give immunotherapy plus uh, chemotherapy in all the uh, patients, irrespective of their PDL1 status, actually. So I think we will stop over there. I mean, otherwise, we could have gone ahead and ahead. And I think uh, that's it. If there are any other questions, we can discuss. If somebody wants to have a doubt or something, Otherwise, thank you. It was lovely. It was fun uh, being with friends. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, just one question, sir. If yes. uh, there's some uh, case, I have a 30 year, uh, 38 year old boy with uh, uh, on Rossman positive, beautiful responding to prezotinib. The only thing is a loculated pleural fusion is there and the mass is there around it. Anything local we can do for that? No, you can do. Uh, you can involve your thoracic surgeon. Uh, let them do a decortication. They'll do a wonderful job. See, what is happening nowadays is that, you know, with all this pleural effusion we are and uh, oral DK that we are giving, you form a uh, fibrin gets formed and you get loculations. So the only thing which will happen, which will help this patient is surgical decortication. And trust me, patient will thank you for referring you to a surgeon because the quality of life of the patient will become very, very good. And so uh, surgical decortication is one thing which will help. So same experience. Uh, so they will have scope of lung expanding. If we keep fluid there, uh, it will not expand even if patient has responded. Yes. So that do help. Yeah, even performance status will improve. Uh, definitely, definitely. And you will get two more referrals for patients. <laughs> uh, so your, uh, one question for my side. New adjuvant versus adjuvant uh, for IO. So I think, uh, uh, you know, the adjuvant data came in first. and uh, But when the uh, TISO versus PEMBRO data came, uh, TISO did not work in PDL1 less than 1. Uh, Pembro worked in uh, PDL1 less than one. Pembro did not work in PDL1 more than 50. Atizo worked in PDL more than 50. So again, I'm a believer of immunotherapy uh, in uh, in both adjuvant and uh, new adjuvant. To me, new adjuvant. The more uh, tumor antigens you have, the more earlier in the in the history of the patient that you give immunotherapy, the more better results you are going to get. So new adjuvant anyways down the line. So again, sir, one question from my side, in a driver mutation positive, uh, where do you fit immunotherapy in subsequent line, in second, third? Uh, I don't like uh, giving immunotherapies. I mean, so only for EGFR mutants, I'll give ABCP. Uh, we have had a patient, two patients who are doing fantastic on artizo bev combination. Uh, but, you know, uh, I would rather go in towards more towards, you know, OC Martinib and second line TKIs and, you know, adding a MET inhibitor to them. Having lost all the, uh, if I have nothing else to give, I'll give ABCP. I will not give ABCP in ALK positive. There is no data for giving that. Only data for giving ABCP is in EGFR mutant lung cancer who have progressed on first or second, gen third generation of TKIs. And for other mutations, sir, like RET, MET, or? Uh, data is not. I mean, RET, MET, mein, PRAL, SETANEB, or uh, CAP, MATAN, I mean, it's a very big thing. I won't give. I mean, it's 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 a different thing altogether. The data is mainly with EGFR. So mainly for EGFR and then BRAF and maybe KRAS. So EGFR, yes. So I think KRAS may I'll give chemotherapy, immunotherapy. So KRAS, okay. I'll give chemo immunotherapy to start with, and then I'll put them into the trial that we have, or okay. I will put them into the trial that we are getting for the first time. So KRAS is settled. BRAF, okay. I'll give, I'll, I'll be okay with giving chemo immunos earlier, later. I would rather give Dabrafenib to start with, but I'm absolutely okay if you don't. I can give chemo immuno after that. That's absolutely okay. Metexon 14, I can give single agent immunotherapy uh, later on. That's also absolutely okay. RET and, uh, and uh, for her to new, I think TDXD has come now. We also again have a trial for that. Entrec, we have had one patient only. Uh, uh, RET. 
Rhett, I think we have given chemos before. It doesn't really respond to immunotherapy. I really won't give. Okay. And uh, yeah, that's it. EGFR and ROS may I will not give. I, I don't give immunotherapy in ROS. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, it was a wonderful session. Everyone were looking forward to it. Uh, and it really helps uh, discussing cases with you. It really helps having fun. Yeah. <laughs> that, that is what it was. It was fun having this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tarachand. Thank you, Anshul. Thank you, Samir. Uh, thank you, Amit. Uh, yes. Rajit was there throughout, but he was not able to hear, I think. <laughs> and my apologies to the BMS people. I didn't realize they were there. <laughs> so, sir, I think so you have complimented with the volume of data. Ullah, sir, is the only moderator which means he can make uh, studying fun. And like uh, we really wait for his uh, sessions and discussions so so that we can really uh, understand the thing and uh, enjoy our time also. Aisa na bolo bhaiya, BB sun rahi hai, padosh wale kamre mein maarengi mujhe. Chalo. Thank you sir, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you sir. Good night. Bye bye. Good night. Thank you everyone. Thank you everyone for joining and good night. Have an exciting time as Ullas.